BS right there, guys. I never hit a guy in my life, especially them big bastards. I'll use a little bit of overhead. I got a little bit of film um, to actually show you what sometimes is discussed but not really done uh, in our business. And um, I, I hope between all this that we'll have an idea uh, of what's going on. Um, from a standpoint of pro ball, my reputation has really developed around zone blocking and zone running. Um, I'm not saying there is a right and a wrong. Um, I'm not saying that you have to do it this way. Uh, I have copied and studied every guy uh, in this, this league I'm in now, as I did in college ball. Um, so many of these things I learned the hard way where I got it stuck up my ass and I didn't have an answer. And I, I kept digging till I found an answer. And I think I've got a few. They may not be right, they may not be legal, they may not be this, that, or in between, but they're what I do, what I teach, and how I go about it. And I'm gonna spend the majority of the time, because I think that's why you're here, and I, I hope we can uh, get to the core of this uh, as we get going. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about zone running and zone blocking as a concept. And I'm gonna show you how we do what we do and what we try to teach. And then I'm gonna go from there to pass uh, because I never, I never let it be one-sided. Uh, in my business, if you can't throw, you can't run. And if you can't run, you can't throw. Uh, the minute you can't do one of those phases, they're going to get you in our league. The minute you can't physically do anything on, a, on an upper level, you have no chance, in my opinion, uh, to, to win the whole deal. So as I go about it, I start with zone blocking because everybody talks about that. But a guy can't play for me because he can run block, can't pass block. That, that, he's got to go. I don't want that guy. I don't want those players. I want players that can adapt and do the things. And I spend uh, pretty much a 50-50 ratio on time and how I teach those guys to do all of that. So I'm going to go from zone blocking right on into pass slides and schemes and show you how those – function for us and then into play action and, and the keeper game, which I think ties to the running game so much. And then talk a little bit about our empty packages because I know so many of you are into those today and how you format them and set them and what the philosophies are. And then, and then we'll open her up and talk about whatever you want to you know, talk about as we go, okay? So first of all, let's, let's talk about zone. Uh, we basically start out with the concept that we're gonna run Wide zone strong and wide zone weak, tight zone strong and tight zone weak. And they must, in every case, be balanced to look the same. So our, our personnel has got to be as close to balanced when we do those things as we can. And then what overloads we can create with formations, and I'll, I'll talk about that, um, then we're gonna create those. But we are a wide zone weak and strong tight and strong uh, inside, with the majority of it being wide zone outside oriented, okay? And we want the formations to look the same. That to, that to me is the perfect world uh, formation-wise. I want a fullback weak, a tailback seven, eight yards deep, a balanced wide, wide receiver formation, and I want to be able to run that wide zone as frequently left as right and vice versa. I know some of you are right formation teams. We are not. We, we flop our formations a great deal based on personnel and mismatches that I can create. Uh, if I feel a guy doesn't match up to me, I'm going to hammer that son bitch till he dies. I, that's just the way I believe. I know other people do it the other way around. But that is the balanced formation to me with a fullback person. Uh, and this guy for me is, is a guard. So we're, we, we have no misunderstandings. He's on scholarship in the NFL 
just like he would be at your university. But he's there for a reason, okay? He is not there to touch the ball. He is there as a receiver, and he's there as a major blocker in our court. And we want to be able to run the wide zone play both that way and that way, okay? Equally from that formation. Now, certain things dictate what I can and can't do. I have to be able to protect the edge uh, both ways. So the, the edge may be protected by me moving this guy that way or that guy that way or started in slot and moved him back. But I'm going to protect the edge enough and clean enough that defensively the eighth hat will not take me out of the play. So we start with that premise. Now we're not a bounce team. And, and when I get into this, I always have a hard time because there are teams that run zone that G block, text block, center pull, uh, and all of you know what I'm referring to. And some of you do it and do it successfully. Many teams in our league do it and do it successfully. We do not do that. We will not do that. Uh, I have to virtually be ordered to do that or I'll get fired before I will ever do that because I want my track to be the same. I want this tailback to drop step and press the tight end's ass or an imaginary tight end's ass so that he is always on the same track. And I don't want anything to bubble that track. I don't want that track where he ever has a reason to do this number if I'm running wide zone. And I want defensively, when we start, I want you to be in a dilemma as to which way is the play going. Now, obviously, if I start moving the receivers, I give you some agenda, but I also present you some problems as to how you're going to do your coverage and dictate the coverage that you're playing behind. And, of course, that has to tie to the passing game. We also are awfully big on moving our fullback to get to that spot. So he very well may do that, or that, or that, or that. He's going to move every week, or we're going to move wide receivers, virtually every play. And if we're not moving, then we're into long cadence and quick count, running the same concepts. So that defensively, we want them up, out, down, lined up so that we can make a decision of this wide zone concept that we're teaching. And our tailback takes a short drop step and he presses that hole. And he has what we consider to be a series of reads. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go into hallowed ground here and talk about something that a lot of people don't believe. But we coach our runner. and. That's sometimes hard to do because he's probably the best athlete that you have playing, your best player. He better be close to your best player for you to be successful. But we coach our guy, and we teach him what he is to read. And we do not believe in our system that a guy can go play and just play with skill. We, we don't allow that. In other words, we don't say, hey, go run where the fucking hole is and dodge through all of them and go. We don't, we don't do that. And there are times it's very frustrating for this person because he comes out of your programs and high school programs and he's the best player, the best athlete. He's never been told what to look at. He never knew what a defense looked like. He didn't understand the schematics of systems. And so we start teaching him right off the get-go this is the hat you read. This is the hat you read. That hat sometimes is there, it's sometimes there, it's sometimes... We teach him a series of reads, and he basically has two on every play. He has a point of attack read and a secondary read, and he is told to run off that read. And it's very foreign for runners to ever be coached that way. Um, 
Coach Ace, when I was at Ohio State many, many, many years ago, said we could never tell a guy where to go. He, he was too good to do that. That if he made yards, he was our guy. And if he didn't, we got him the fuck out. We got another guy, you know. And I'm not saying he was wrong, because obviously he won a lot more football games than I won. But I believe you coach him. And I believe when you take the film and you take the defense and you teach them the, the, the process, I think they have a quick read. If we were running wide zone week and they were in a, a you know, a weak reduction defense, we tell them that's, that's your number one hat. And you're going to press the hole as if you had an imaginary tight end right there and you're going to read that guy. If that guy goes out, you go in. If that guy goes in, you go out. And you make one read, one cut off that guy. He always has a secondary cut. In this defense, it's obviously the second guy weak. And if that guy goes out, you go in. He goes in, you go out. So he reads one to two right now. And he lives with his read. And a lot of people say you can't do that. You can't functionally tell a guy that's that skill where to go. I don't believe it. I don't believe that, and I coach the fuck out of them. Uh, I, I run the 9-on-7 drill. I run the 9-on-7 pictures uh, that we have, just like I'm sure you have. And, uh, and I'm up that guy's ass just like I am that left guard and that left tackle and that center because I believe there's a close orientation into that process. When we run the ball strong, if it were a weak reduction team and we had this look strong, is base to most people. That is our read guy. We do not read the end man on the line of scrimmage uh, because he is a backer. In our opinion, the backer is a contained player. So we read that guy as one and we read the next guy as two. So his read going that way is that, that system. If the reduction went the other way, And there's his one read, and there's his two. And if you ran it out the weak side, again, I don't read that one. I read that one to the nose as being number two. And here's the way we coach our runner. And I know this is going to sound strange, but we tell our runner, you get one. You get one cut. One. And whatever you make, you live with it. If it's out, then it's out. If it's in, it's in. What we don't want is feather feet. We don't want any decision making in that hole when we run our wide zone. And we have some, some problems teaching it. We have some guys that come out like you do that they want to make everybody miss. We don't want that guy. A lot of the great, great runners wouldn't fit in the system. But what we've been able to do is take guys that are maybe good college players and make them great pro runners by forcing them to fit into the system. Now, when I teach the blocking schemes, the blocking schemes we're going to use are all geared to making that read very simple. Because I'm going to create that guy going somewhere if I possibly can. So when we teach the zone system, uh, the up front people and the backs are tied to the fact that it's going to happen right now. We aren't going to hesitate and make it be almost right now. We're not going to dip. We're not going to do. We're not going. We're going to make a read, and we're going to live with our read, just so we're we're all uh, talking the same language. Now, when we um, when we set those schemes to block those people, the thing I want to be able to do, and I'll I'll take it out the weak side since I started there first is I want this guy to tell my runner very quickly, as fast as I possibly can, is it an inside of him or outside of him read? Not, not maybe, is it or is it not, okay? So the, the landmark I'm going to take on that guy is obviously got to be one-on-one. -on -one. I don't have any way to double him. I don't have any way to get a hat on him. I don't have any way to influence him. But I'm going to convince my tackle that you go at him uh, stretching him, uh, trying to control his inside with your inside arm. And I want him to come in or go out. What I don't want him to do is not to give my runner a decision. 
I want that guy clearly uh, showing me where I'm going to run the ball. So I go at him and I stretch his outside and I grab or club with the inside hand. I'd rather grab than club, but some of them are so adapt at hat out, club out, and they get good at it that I don't argue that point. But I know the great defender wants to stretch you and throw you out and fall back in on our runner. So I insist that his inside hand has to be his grab hand. And I tuck that sucker in there hard and tight. And I work it uh, in a drill constantly where the defenders grab my blockers throw them physically, throw them physically to the point that they develop great inside hand strength. And that will force that guy to maneuver somewhere. Now he may come up the field on me, but if he comes up the field, I'm going to club him out and the reed's inside of him. That is defensively the worst thing you can do to the system is to run up. If you hold your water right there, you're in business, but you're threatened by the fact that you're stretched. Now, the next guy in, which is the, the hard read, we double. And a lot of people don't do it this way. Uh, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but we take these three guys and we work a combination into the reduced defense on every play, okay? Because that is the read that has to be as fast as possible because it's the first cut read. If the end played out there, then the first cut read it's going to be off this guy. If that guy came in, the ball's bounced. It didn't matter what the, the inside of the defense did. So these guys work a combination together with the back guard having the nose singled. Now, I grew through the world just like you probably did, that this was always done that way. I, I don't do that. And the reason I don't do that is the guy over my left guard is a better player than my left guard every week. Every week, this guy is a better player than that guy. So through the years, I said, now how am I going to convince my guard, left in a right formation and right in a left formation, how am I going to convince him that he can come out on a guy bigger, stronger, more powerful, lined up almost all sides, in many cases are all sides, how am I going to keep that penetration down so that the runner can stay on the path that I chose, the tight end path? And we developed a system where we tell our guard, you block the outside half of that three technique. You, you have his outside half. You don't have his inside half. So you come off uh, with good width, and you knock the outside half of him off the ball. You, you don't have him off. You don't worry about any inside wiggle. You don't worry about any swim move. You don't worry about any guy that is muscle bound, that sits right there powerful, because the inside half's coming. And the center goes to his inside half, and we train these two, and we work just constantly. Where he goes out, the center starts to climb. He comes in, the guard starts to climb. And they are going to double that guy as long as he doesn't move. If he sits there, we're going to double him up, and the runner's going to run off that three, provided the outside guy didn't run. Now, a lot of people don't do it that way, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's the way we do it. As a result of that, our fullback never enters the hole other than off the same read that the runner did on that one. So our fullback, be him in motion or whatever, he has got that backer off the same read that the runner has. So that if the end were to come in, he'd go out knowing the back is going out, and the back has to follow him into the system, into the wide zone set. He has the wheel backer, but he doesn't have him in A gap. He's only got him in B and C, and he's reading it like a runner. So he attacks the tackle, the tackle's block shows him out, he goes in, he goes him in, he goes out, and he's looking for the next backer on the inside level. The only exception to that is if we ever got corner fire, and I know a lot of you guys do that in college football because of those tight hash marks. We're seeing it more in pro ball because of you suckers in college ball starting it, we tell our fullback if he ever enters B and sees a weak corner blitz, that he is now the blitzer that has become the, the wheel backer. And so our fullback, if he ever saw this come from that edge, he would block that edge to keep that ball always 
pressing the hole. Then the wide receiver is told, instead of blocking the corner and or safety inverting, he's got the wheel back. So, and we live in that world now. We live in that world to keep the negative away from the process. And I'll talk about that negative as we go. Now, one of the problems you have when you start this system is this backside mic can run the back door of the play. So you have to have developed a system out your backside that says, we're going to alert these guys like so. Now, our back tackle doesn't have that mic backer unless he blitzes. But if he blitzes, he will chop him in the back hole right now. And our tight end will come to the five technique. If the mic runs over the top, then they take that to the safeties instead. And all of that was incorporated into a system so that the runner could do what I told you when we started. And that is press the ball, make a decision, and get that way as fast as whatever. Now, everybody that, that studies us, that does the films, does the TVs, they keep talking about all our cutbacks. And let me tell you, it is, it, it is not the way you really think it is. When our runner starts that path and he comes under that three, the majority of the time when he makes that cut under that three technique, he will be outside of where the imaginary tight end was when he makes that cut. Because the defense has stretched that far. And when you stretch the defense that far, that cut by the runner is not as drastic as you think it is. It does not take that talented a cut by a runner. What he's made a decision is the outside guy said it's coming inside. The second guy says run off me. That's what the decision is. If he goes under the three to you as a TV person, as a film person, it would look to you like he's cutting behind. Sometimes he'll go behind the nose and the nose is actually outside of where the tight end would be by the time it gets over there. Now there is no dip in this you got to understand, there is no dip. So we're selling a runner that we're taking a downhill path. Now, if I flip that, and I flip it to a 4-3 defense, it, it doesn't really matter to us. It's the same concept. We want this guy over here to constantly present you that we have a weak side run, and we run the same stretch. We don't read a backer on the ball. We read the first down lineman on the ball. He goes out, you go in. If he goes out, you read number two. In this case, that number two is now doubled with those two. If it were a bubble defense, different than everybody else does it, we force that end to go somewhere. We take the guard, and on the snap of the ball, he heads diagonally at the hat of that guy, and he drives him out and bounces to the backer. The backer will plug on him, and we'll have a little mess spot right there that we fit up on. But he knows right now that his read has told him, I'm going inside of number one. If number one came down, like a zone dog, which we all see, and they run the mic, Sam's zone dogs, then he's jumping outside because his read told him to. If we ever got that front, he's going in that crack right there because the, the reed told him to come down. Obviously now the guard would take that over and the tackle would slide up and all of you do that and everybody has done that for a thousand years. That, that's no different. Where it's a little different for us is if it got reduced strong, which we're seeing more and more of in pro ball. We now go to double on that one, just like we went double on the other one. And now the combination is these two guys working on the sound back. Again, what do we want our tackle to do? Same thing we want our guard to do. We want to drive that puppy out and make the cut come inside. Now, I want to slow down here a minute because I know I'm going at my pace and that may or may not be what you want or what you need. But I want to slow down and explain why we came to this, this theory. Um, at Denver, 
we feel that the passing game is in itself a big little system. You're going to have big plays and you're going to have zero plays. You're going to have some negatives in everything. You're going to have some fumbles that you don't want. You're going to have some sacks that you don't want. You're going to have some interceptions you don't want. You're going to have negatives in everything you do. And you try to eliminate those just like we all do. But we look at pass as being yes, no. In other words, if we throw it, you know, 36 times, we would like to complete 21, 22 of them, hopefully more than that, maybe a few less, but somewhere in that range. But there's a lot of plays that are zero. When we turn our running game around, we're just the opposite. We want no negative. We don't want to run plays that are big little, even at the expense of big ones. We do not want that theory. We want a system where the bad play gains two, three, one and a half, four, three and a half. We want that to be the negative side of it because then we can stay on cycle and stay out of third and long, which is what our whole objective is. So when we developed a running game, we immediately started throwing out the runs that we couldn't find a way to make consistent. Well, wide zone became our way of living. Because if you have a good offensive line and a, and a play action concept and a keeper game, you have a great chance of always staying on cycle. You, you can keep your running game always in that category of whatever it is to be successful. You know, at our place, 4.5 is what our guy has to have. Uh, the last three years, our runner has been 5-1, 5-0, and 5-1, our runner, because we have one, just one. That's, our guy is a runner. And we want that to be on that consistent level. Do we have some long ones? Yes. But we, what we don't want is second and 12 in our running game. So when we devise this system, we devise the system that gave us the best opportunity to do that, to eliminate penetration, to eliminate a system where a runner was sometimes making great runs and sometimes losing yardage. We don't want that guy. That is not what we do. We want it to be on a level. And we wanted it to overlap when we changed formations. So for instance, and here's the beauty of wide zones, if your tight end is not in your grouping, because you're now in some form of flex, or slot with flex or tight end over here, we wanted our teaching of our fullback running weak zone to be strong and weak so that the teaching was the same. Does that make sense? We wanted it to be on the same teaching level so that anytime our center and guard got that look, they knew exactly where they were going. They knew how to set the structure. Now, all we had to be able to do was decipher where our fullback is and what his responsibilities are. And that way, we could start doubling up on formations. One of our favorite formations, as it is with you guys, and we do it a million ways, every week different, is to get two tights on the ball. Because now our teaching of wide zone is the same left or right. It, it is the same. Does that, does that make sense? It, it doesn't really matter to us how we got there. We could have started here and motioned to there and gone here or gone back there. But our teaching is the same teaching and our upfront philosophy is the same zones. So now while they're taking the formation and changing it week after week and they've now got to line it up different, then we've adapted the formation the way we want. And out of that, there's a million ways for your passing game to be you know, very established. A lot of people like it that way. A lot of people like it that way. A lot of people like it that way. And we change that every week to find what we think is the best way to tie the pass with those runs. But the run is still going to come out wide zone. And if it's a tight end there, it's wide zone strong. And it doesn't matter how you adapt it. You've taught those guys Okay, now how are we going to come off? What is the angle we come off? What is the backside call combination? How do we adapt it the best way? Okay? And there's tricks that everybody tries on us that we've had to adapt different ways to do things. 
Uh, some of the 4-3 teams we see force us into this combination, and I don't like it. I do not like that combination because I don't think the center has a fair chance there into that combination of 4-3. But all of these stunts knocked me off the mic back. So I had to adapt those. We see a lot of this blocking scheme uh, against our front to stop the wide zone out the weak side where the reduction guy tries to knock the center off and then the looper comes around and we've had to widen the angles that each of these guys took to the point that we still could take that pincher and scoop him with the center and the backside guard. Now you can say, well, how in the hell did you do that? Well, how did you have time to do that? How do you make the time to do it? I don't run, but wide zone weak and wide zone strong and tight zone weak and tight zone strong. I'm not getting into those plays that have a million adjustments that have negatives. And I know the first thing that comes up in your mind is, yeah, but coach, you know how good our counter play is? And do you know how good our power play is? And do you know how good our draw play is? And do you know how good our weak trap is and our strong trap? Yeah, I do, I do. But I also know when I turn on them fucking films, and I look at every one of you guys' films. I do 75 players a year uh, in March and April. I do 75 college football players I have to break down. And I, I look at every one of you that, that have a guy coming out. And I see a lot of great plays. And then I go four plays down there and I see that same son bitch and he came out for minus two, you see. See, I'm gonna get fired for that. My, my, my boss don't want that, he don't want that. He wants me to say, uh, Alex, give me second and seven at the worst play. I'd love second and three, but give me second and seven. And so everything we do is geared off of that process and we're able to take runners that I think are young, inexperienced runners and we start demanding those tracks start demanding the read and the angles that we take. Meanwhile, these suckers right here, these five guys that I got, they're coming off with every one of those combinations on virtually every practice play we have. We do them tight and we do them wide. The tight play we really would probably replace before we did the wide unless they come out in a defense that is wide on both sides. If they come out on a defense that's wide on both sides, we love tight zone because the rollback play to a width guy is an automatic steal. What we see more of are, are people trying to make the ball bounce. And we don't want to bounce, we want to go in a diagonal. So as we approach that, I know we look at it different than you do, and, and, and how we're trying to create those is a part of our leverage. Now I'm gonna stop right there unless somebody's got something right there that they just feel like they gotta jump into. And I want you to understand that all of this goes on with our ability to control the backside of the play. And we have a different way of approaching that than, than, than most of you do, I'm sure, uh, because we demand two things on the backside of every play. First of all, when that ball is given off that way, that quarterback will run a full speed keeper. Now to ask an NFL quarterback to do that is a little hard. I, I struggled with John Elway for five fucking years. Now he won't run no goddamn keepers at the backside of a wide zone play. But we convinced him through the same maneuvers that you convince your guys that his presence of faking that and coming this way was in itself at least worth a hat or a hat and a half on every play, okay? So when you see Denver play, you will see the quarterback fake that ball and turn and run full speed keeper for two to three steps. So they have got to be prepared for that ball to come back out, okay? Now you gotta remember that in our running game, the keeper game is, it's a companion. Every run has that keeper. Weak, strong, open formation, flex formation, wide receiver formation, and that quarterback is going back there to hold the defense. Okay, that's, that's number one. That's, that's the big part of the backside of the defense. 
The second part of the backside, and, and here's where I get into some rule changes with you guys, and I don't know what they are, and I really don't want to know, but I know what we do, and I know uh, what's taught. But when we run wide zone, we're cut blockers on the backside. Okay? And it, it's, it's rough. It, it's ugly. It's, it's tough. It's nasty. Uh, but what we do is everybody who blocks behind the ball, whoever their assigned person is, they are going to cut the defender on their inside. So when I drew up, for instance, that tight end tackle going through that alley, because I told you that guard's gone, that guy, if that mic ever shows in that tight end, will cut the, the legs of that defender on the inside. As I said, I don't know your rules, and I don't really want to know your rules. I know my problems. Um, two years ago, after three straight years of, of leading the NFL in rushing, uh, they called us all in, and they changed the rule in the NFL that you can no longer clip them in that region. And everybody assumed that, well, there goes the Denver running game, because they got no chance now. Because between the quarterback faking the keeper and everybody going down and chopping legs, we had backside seams, because remember what I told you, those three techniques play out, I'm going in. You, 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 understand? you see the picture? So the backside, all I gotta do is hold them off a little, and I got some backside seams that are not as big of cutbacks as you think they are because of those cut blocks. And the rule changed in our league that you could not clip in the clip zone. The old clip zone was uh, an imaginary tight end to an imaginary tight end, two yards on either side of the ball. We no longer can clip anywhere. We can cut, but we cannot clip. And we were very frustrated uh, about what we were gonna do. I mean, well, this was revolutionary for us. And you know, what we found out is it actually helped us. Because what happened is we demanded that our players not only get those cutoffs, but that they get their hat on the other side. Our cuts improved. Uh, the nastiness of the cuts improved. Uh, we did not have one fine this season. We had two last year, the first year that it changed. They fine us on films. Uh, if they see something, uh, the, guy, the player gets a, a, a mail from FedEx, send in 2,500, 2, uh, 4,000, 6,000, whatever, and the player has to play it. So you can imagine, I got a hard time selling my guy to do something he's gonna have to pay for. And that's difficult now. That's very difficult. Uh, but when we convinced them that they could get there, we actually improved our skills. And we got better at knowing where to go to the cutoff angle. So between these two things, the lane behind is a big lane. And if we get to it, I've got all the cut up films showing you weak wide zone, uh, strong side. It, it's, it's over and over and over and over. And what begins to happen is you see a softening effect taking place because remember the balance of what I was referring to, I want them to not know is it going there and I'm cutting these or am I going there and I'm cutting these and is the quarterback faking the keeper out the weak side or is the quarterback faking the keeper out the strong side? You got to picture what I'm saying? And out of that really has given us an advantage. And everybody's trying to do this, to copy it, because it's like anything, if you steal anything, it's good, it's working. Uh, are those three running backs all great th running backs? No, they're not. But one of them is a great running back. The other two are players. That's all, they're players. Uh, but defensively, they start playing soft because they don't know whether they're on the cutoff side and are they the container on the keeper? And when you get them playing soft, then the point of attack on the wide zone gets better and better and better. Now the really great defensive football teams are able, obviously, to do this better than others. But we have found that out of that system, if we can keep the eighth hat, ninth hat out of the pile, we will run the ball almost everybody, a, a, a majority, at a consistent level, and that's what we're trying to do. And those two things hold the backside of the defense 
for the front side. The front side is combinationed in every case so that nobody is in an overload if they possibly can be. And then we pick the guy we want to get and we go to that guy. All right? Now, the, the, the last element that I haven't entered here before I get on is our wide receivers. And, and I, wanna, I just want to put that down up here because I'm in the perfect world. Okay? I'm ornery and I don't uh, need to make friends. I don't need a pay raise. I don't, need, I don't need a fucking thing. So that wide receiver is frightened of me. Okay, he's frightened of me. And that's hard to get. And I got a head coach that lets me coach him, that lets me scream at him, that lets me bust their balls. I don't hit them like Marion Kirby's story here. I don't hit them, but I make their life miserable in front of their teammates. And I demand that they be a participating part of this running game. I demand it. And I know a lot of you can't get that control. And I coached for years and years where I could not do it. Uh, we had to fire some receivers at Denver when we first got there. We actually cut the two best receivers uh, the first year after our first season there. We had to cut them. We had to get them out of there because they didn't think that was a part of their job. And so we have the perfect element here, in my opinion, to, to be able to run the ball. We have a philosophy of no loses, no losses. We have a philosophy of doubling the point of attack so the runner can read. We have a philosophy of quarterback being unselfish enough to fake keepers on all plays. You got me? We have backside players that are going to try their damnedest to chop your legs out, okay? And then we have wide receivers that block the eighth and ninth hat. Unselfish. Now, is that a perfect world? No, it isn't, because we struggle just like you do in many cases when, A, we can't throw it that day, or B, the runner's hurt, or we lost the fullback, or the tight end's got a piss-poor attitude that day, or the receiver that day. I mean, we go through the same trials that you do. I mean, our jobs are hard, too, to demand that. But having a running game geared where I can demand that, I've got the perfect world because I can take the 9 on 7 film and I can say to the wide receiver in front of his peers now, words he's never heard, and I can take the fullback and I can take the tight end and I can demand it. Now, let me cover one more thing about the cuts and then I'll push on from that. When we practice, we do not cut our own players. We, we never cut our own players. And basically, here's the way we say it. If you tackle, we cut. If you tackle, we cut. You don't tackle, you butt them up, we don't cut. So, so whenever the game starts, they're tackling, we're cutting, okay? When we practice, we practice by tackling the player we're supposed to cut. Does that make sense? So if I got that guy right there, the only way I can find out if my guy has enough foot speed and quickness to go get him is he has got to go tackle that guy. And he literally, without going to the ground, he goes in and he tackles the defender be he a linebacker or whatnot. And um, I know a lot of people were very concerned about that, about uh, did you hurt somebody? Did you, um, did you have a lot of fights? Did you have, you know, all that shit. And, you know, we answered them as quickly as we could. Coaches, here's the deal. You, you want us to cut you, we'll cut you, okay? But we'd rather tackle you so we don't hurt you. And it, it works out over time. But that was a very hard process for us to get our defensive people to understand what we were trying to do so that we didn't hurt those guys. It did teach them great gap control uh, because they knew they had to get there, okay? Now, when we started all this, um, we, we started picking a different lineman than most of the NFL teams do. We don't pick high. Uh, we've never... I've been in 17 years, never had a number one draft choice. Never had a one, not one. Uh, what we do is we draft guys that are a lot like the guys that I see you redshirting. He's a tall, skinny kid who's tough and smart and wants to play so bad he'd die. And we, we, we redshirt him in our system just like you do in your system. And we find that that guy, we can find a guy that can run, 
that is athletic, that has recoverability, uh, but he doesn't have bulk and strength. He doesn't know what his body's about yet. And we hold on to him just like you do, waiting for that to come. And so our, most of our development comes out of that phase where we pick characteristically those things. Um, our tackles are very athletic players. And many of them, uh, you know, nobody talked about or knew at all uh, from some of your schools. Um, and you would say, why him? What that? Well, we just saw a tall six foot four tackle with length that had no basic strength, but he could run. Athletically, he could run. And we were willing to wait for him to develop uh, the, the power to be a player while we were teaching him our system. Uh, on the inside, we don't worry near as much about height and length. We think players can be way too tall on the inside. And we look for a guy that is a marginal height leveraged player guys that are really low-waisted uh, guys that have leverage under their bodies and we don't have a lot of fat guys we 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 run them all the time we're constantly uh, believe they, they they stay healthier by uh, not being heavy and we we turn away now you got to remember to cut off the guys we trying to cut off you got to be able to run You've got to have leverage. You've got to have athletic abilities. So we take guys that in many cases people don't want to draft. And sometimes we have to go up a little higher than we want to because we've earmarked a guy. And, uh, but historically we've had a lot, of, a lot of luck doing it that particular way and waiting on them. Rarely do any of them play early. That is very rare. Um, we like to send our guys to the World League. We like to send our guys uh, through this system that we're in. Uh, they must be very smart on the inside, uh, unbelievably smart. Uh, we do not take uh, guys that are great athletes that maybe aren't smart enough to play and play them inside. We don't even try. We have a test score limit there that would, would scare you. Uh, and it, it, it requires all the adjustment levels and so we don't play around with that at all. And then probably more important than any of that is I want to see what their history was playing for you injury-wise. If they were hurt for you, they're going to be hurt for me. I don't want guys to get hurt. I do not want guys that miss games. Uh, most of my guys get operated on after the season, uh, some form or fashion, fingers, toes, elbows, hands, knees, uh, but they do not miss. They do not miss. And if they didn't miss for you, the odds are good. If they missed for you, I'm barking up the wrong tree, in my opinion. And so when I look for those characteristics, I'm looking for a guy that can play with great toughness and desire. And he, he, he doesn't have any ego because, hell, nobody wanted him, you know. And if you go back and look at a lot of your red shirts, I'm sure you know exactly. You can, you can come up with two or three guys that you say, boy, that's exactly what he's talking about. That's the kind of guy I want. I don't want a guy that doesn't want to play. I don't want a guy that I got to beg to play. I don't want those. Those are skilled athletes. Those are not the guys. They're the, the wide receivers I got to talk into blocking force and elements. Uh, that's the quarterback that I got to convince to run the keeper when he's handing a ball off going the other way. That, that's that guy. I don't want that, that person in, in our core grouping uh, when we run this wide zone play so, so we can understand. Okay, now I'm gonna throw some on and uh, and talk about it off film. And if you got questions, we'll start right in the middle of it, and away we go. All right. So I'll just take you through the progression. Our left tackle, left guard, are trying to make that read so that that runner has no choice. Does, does everybody with me there? I'm going to make him cut behind that five because that five technique did not pinch down. Okay, and our center's gonna reach the shade and we're gonna cut the back door. That right guard did not cut and I promise you, he got chatted with very quickly off that backside. Now always keep her right here, I would blast. But if you'll see the wide guy on the outside over there, he did hang a hair and that created the running lane that I'm trying to make happen, 
okay? And as I said, I got against all these guys all these years, and if we got to slow down, we can. These are all run strong. You can see the left tackle and the left guard. I don't like the technique the left tackles use. That fat ass needs to get his feet moving better than that. But the right guard did a great job of making the runner read behind the nose. His read was to the end, to the nose. The, 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 the quarterback is holding a weak safety. If you'll see that weak safety back there, he is afraid to leave because of the element of keeper. Now, this was a one-back set, but because it was a strong zone, it didn't matter to us. You see, the teaching is the same teaching, and it doesn't really matter uh, how it happens. I'm not really interested in anything but just the teaching of the backside systems. Again, the right tackle, I think that's shitty. That just makes me sick and want to throw up. The right guard got in deep. The left guard forced the runner to run where he wanted, and I don't like the runner's pause. Okay, now this is MVP in the league, and I promise you when he came off that field, I ripped his nuts because he cannot wait that long to make that cut. I can't block him long enough for that to happen. Now, when we run it into a reduction side, a lot of times stunts like that occur. We have all kind of concepts that we're teaching, and I know a lot of you would say, well, you can't just fall into that way well, you don't. You gotta work at that. But that system is devised, it's out of a two tight end element. We didn't get great cut by the backside tight end. The runner had a bounce read because his read told him, go out. That's one of the few times that the ball will actually do that in the system. The right guard's going to force it out. The left guard should cut. He did not cut. I guarantee he got ripped. The left tackle didn't have an angle to cut. It, it is no mystery what's happening back here to the back side of the defense. Now, he chose to go out because his read told him to. Had his read told him inside, the big play here would have been downhill. But you have to live with that world. If you've told him his read is the end man on the line of scrimmage, he clearly goes out. If his read w w were to jump out, then you would expect him back here where these three chops are. Uh, he bounced it to the top because that's what his read was. And you've got to live with those. You've got to say to yourself, well, now, wait a minute. What is the best way for this to function? The cut on the back door by the fullback, the cut by the tight end, the guard should have cut right there. The left guard made the read go where the read ought to go. Now that's what happens when linebackers plug. The end is clearly inside of our tackle, so the runner should take the ball to the top. He should run off the tight end, just like he did. Now we back here don't know that. We're still trying to cut it right tackle. We're trying to cut it right guard, and the keeper is faking keeper out the quarterback out the back edge. Now his read said, 92 said, uh, Reggie White jumped out. Uh, Gilbert Brown jumped out. The backside cutters are cut down, and he runs down the pipe. Now, to me, that, that's football play right there. I, of all the ones I've seen, I like that the best because it's consistent. I mean, everything there is a clean four, five, six, four, five, six. Let it happen. You know, then go to the, go to the passing game. Run it off of what you believe in the passing game. The right guard, we don't cut a tight shade because they smell us, and that's why you're not seeing a cut on the back door here. The tight end should have. The tackle notice went all the way up to the next level player, which I'm sure you're teaching to. The tackle's angle here was bad at right. Center didn't work double combination here because of something was taught that week. There's a softness there. I don't like it left guard. I don't like feet coming back like that for the runner. Now, here's the beauty of the cuts, and, and this is the classic, you know, when they get cut back door, and everybody says that's the Denver cutback. Now, look where that cutback occurs, because you see the tight end's a yard inside this hash mark. When he makes that cut, he's four yards outside that hash mark. That cut is not as drastic as you think it is. It, it's, it's the element of the defense that's creating it. 
I don't like the stutter that this runner took. I also don't like the fact that my right guard got stuffed back in the backfield. But that's a part of the world of one cut, live with it. Ball going left, wide combination, the ball should bounce. The ball going right should never bounce. Ball going left should bounce. The ball going right should bounce as well. Three worked out. He worked in. Cuts on the back door, created the running lane. This was before the rule was changed, and both those tackles today would be fine because their body momentum actually cut the back of the legs. That's clipping now. It was not then. We've got much better at this than we were at this point. That's a wide receiver down in the briar patch down in there because that's our system. He's going to be down in there now. We don't block corners. We block safeties. We make corners tackle. And they're as shitty a tacklers in our league as they are in yours. That read says go out. That's as clean as a bell to me. Now, a lot of these on film are Terrell Davis, who was our player a couple years ago. Um, we've had two very fine ones the last two years. Not as good as him, but very good. Again, you see those backside combinations. That's, that's where we think the whole thing's created. That ball bounced, but his read outside told him that guy's inside of the defensive tight end. He's got to bounce that to the edge. I'm ready. All right, I got that real too. All right, if I do that, I have to make a call that, that basically alerts two people. Uh, it alerts the front that we have no fullback blocker. The question he has asked is, when you're in one back and you run the ball weak, the quarterback is a responsibility because the wheel must be walked. The backer weak must be walked so that a receiver and or whoever is removed has got that guy. So the quarterback's a big part of that element. And then the way we teach it, it's not. You have a shot there with tackles on and up to the big backer. Well, here's, here's the, up to the weak backer and no reduction? No reduction. Three, four, Whoa. three, four are well outside. Like so? There was nobody on this guy? No, was off, yeah. He was, he was off? Yeah, he was on three, four up in the wheel. He didn't bring motion. So that guy? Yeah, but he was off. Yeah, I, I, I shouldn't, that should not occur. Make call. Basically, if they were to remove that guy, yeah. we could run it with no call. If that guy were, rem were not removed, and we have to account for that guy, then a term has to be added to the phrase. He belongs to the fullback. He's got to be a receiver or a fullback or a fullback that's motioned toward him. Okay? Cover two, and the guy around with him. In and out, in and out. Quarterback has to make a decision. He's got to make a decision. And we do the very same thing strong um, to the flex side. So the flex side of a tight end is the same as a weak side concept for the quarterback and the training of those players. Uh, as I said, we run this same thing out, out the weak side of the defense. So that now the blocking schemes are the same. The cut blocks back here are the same. The zone play of the left guard, so he's not going to let that in, not give us a read. We're going to force the runner to run where we want the runner to run. We want to create the hole, and then he gets in the hole, he's got to do what he's got to do. 
If the fullback is not present, the quarterback has to either check it or control it. And then I'm going to take, take you a little bit to force element schemes because of all the eight-man fronts. You teams that run it a lot, you, you'd understand what I'm talking about. Now, this game, our center did not work triple combination. That's the way we did it three years ago. We don't do it that way anymore because we don't feel our guards can win. The club by the left tackle is done exactly with what I got in mind. That, that path by 30 is the same path. He's got to read. He reads outside to inside and watch the left guard club with his inside arm. And they call that holding, you know, I don't buy that shit. That's fucking football. Okay. Not to the wheel back, to the mic back. Not to the wheel. Wheel belongs to the fullback. The only time you take wheel is in A. He belongs to someone else. I think the most important thing is what the guards do to force the read clean. I don't like that left guard leaning right there. I, I don't like that. I think that's tough, and that's why 30 held, held his numbers right there before he spit through. I think in the long run, you're asking for trouble right there. I get the films of every nine on seven with them twice a week. And, uh, and, the, and the head coach lets me make an ass of myself on the sideline. They do not want to see me. If what? Okay, we, we do like everybody else does, uh, I, I guess. We double it this way. And I don't care whether this is strong or weak, so it could be that way or not. If he comes up, they do that. They double the walk up just like he's a three technique. Because then, whether he picks in or picks out, you've got the same combination of concepts. And I think that's a, a very important phase of this that uh, you, can't over, you can't overlook that. Um, I'm afraid we're getting stymied. Let me show a few more. I, I, I don't want to slow everybody down, but at the same time, I want to give you your money's worth and try to at least talk about, you know, how all these fit. Now, we're big with our lock hand. 65 right there is as good as I've ever had. Uh, he has got great strength in his hands, but he might weigh 261, 264. Uh, that center is 281 since time began. Uh, the right tackle sometimes weighs 85, a lot of times 81, 82. I, I just think that fucking fat shit is overdone now. I, now here's that combination I was talking about, how you got to be able to twist that over. Uh, that's, that's a tough combination. Uh, that takes a lot of work, Garrett. I, I don't mind telling you. Now a lot of times we do this with our backside tight ends. If we find a Sam backer that's worried, when we had Sharp, we did a lot of this because he actually would take the Sam and the safety thinking keepers coming back here and not block him in the play. We do that a lot of times. Uh, it, it, it bothers some people. I'm not saying it, it's going to win a goddamn game, but it's a part of I don't like this blocking scheme because 30 had to do that. When, when he had to do that, I, I, don't, I don't like that. I don't, I don't want any part of that kind of football. And, and that's what changed me into a triple blocking scheme. That, that's what I want to do right there. I want to double combo and slide through and cut the back door and lock off at, at the point of attack tackle. We don't cut our fullback a lot unless they're really good players uh, at linebacker that we don't think we can block. But what the right guard is doing there to me is created the whole and it's amazing how many of these guys you can chop. Now I'm just, uh, I'm sorry? Now I'd reach the center. And if I can get down here far enough, let me jump down here far enough. We started that two years ago. Now we do it on every play. Uh, it has really helped our system. Uh, our right tackle guard had a bust here, thought the ball was going over this way, but the combination of center guard to Mike, to me there is what this is about. And here's an end that got hooked. I know a lot of you think it never goes out there. It'll go out there if you teach him reads. That, that end told him to jump out now. And he's going to do what the read tells him in our system. We've, we've been able to get that talk to our guys. Same here. I think that ball should have gone to the edge. He thought there was too much penetration. 
And that's the magic word at our place. If the feet of the linemen go back, and 65s do go back there some, then the runner has to make a decision of downhill. I don't like to let that happen. I, I, I want it clean so he doesn't have that rebuttal. Do you change the vertical split of the running backs in all The vertical. No, no. No, no. He's seven and a half, eight yards. Uh, our running back coach controls that. The fullback motion changes constantly with wheel on, wheel off the ball because we don't want a wheel to blow us up back in the backfield. Now here, to me, he could have taken the ball out there, but he saw, he saw grass. This is one of our second or third kids. Uh, at least he went downhill, see? And I don't have any bitches when that shit happens. Now here's a great combination they worked through. Uh, that's a, you know, that, that's a nose looper by zone blocking that you got no chance. The right tackle uh, got cut off back here, uh, but there's some good things took place. As Reed goes in, he's going out. We'd like the fullback to eat up more of the wheel backer than that. We bring him from everywhere just like you guys do because of our passing game. You know, we don't want to be in a stagnant formation. We don't want him to practice the formations that we're going to run. We, we want those changing. I'm not getting much of the way we're doing it right now. And maybe I'll just jump on down here if I can get onto it. Ends inside, Reed goes outside. Now here's where we had to change for this. Now this is Sal at Will Backer. Our center had him in A-gap, but he didn't see that as blitz. He saw that as a guy running out, not in. And that's when we started working three-man combinations because our fullback does not go in that hole. He does not go in that hole. We won't to stretch the defense. So this was a great teaching point, and I put it in just for that reason. Now, we could always get him like this. The hard one was the other way. That's a great combination by the center working all the way back to the backside door. And you can see the right guard didn't get it done, but boy, he knew exactly what he was trying to get done right there. But I think that combination of center, left guard, left tackle, that's as good as you can teach right there. I think you're going to see that the over, overriding point in almost all of this is that lack of penetration. Uh, we have good plays when we don't have them. Uh, we put together a bunch of film just like you do, and we teach off of it. And, uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit about how we do that sometime uh, if we have some time here at the end. Um, I think what I'd like to do, and then head to pass real quick, but I, I'd like to talk about the fullback in the play. So what we have is we have wide zone strong with our fullback being what we call the force blocker. Okay. Now up front, we're still operating with the same premises. So we would have done this. Does that make sense? And we teach that theory weak and strong. It's taught more strong than weak because a lot of people do it this way. bring the weak safety down over here and put the mic over strong, we make the mic the strong safety in the concept and we teach it based on this by being on the ball so that now they're here and now the fullback is on that guy. Now that's become our short yardage, our red zone, our four minute offense. That's become our first and 10 when we have to keep the ball alive and we have spent hours and hours and hours developing a phase where the fullback 
is a part of the call. So it's wide zone strong force. Does that make sense? And we have had to do it weak over the last year. And this would answer the question you asked about how do you account for Will. We see this defense, a pile, where Will comes all the way to that A gap. Mike plus is over, and the weak safety is sitting right there. So now we have adapted to wide zone weak fullback force so that that's the fullbacks, and now those have those, and those have those. And in order to account the eight-man front, we've added a term, weak and strong, that told us we now count them out, and we structure them differently. We were forced to do that. Um, it is the only way, in my, point, in my opinion, to put a game away. And those of you who don't have the ability to put a game away, that's the saddest thing, I think, in football. And I, the games that hurt me the worst is when we have a lead, we got the ball, and we let them have another chance on offense. Their side. I, it just kills me. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to run an offense that doesn't give me ability to put the clock away. Now, a lot of people immediately go, and this is not our style. We do some of this, but... We, this isn't our style. We, we don't like this formation. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, it, to me, you have no threat now of a pass at all. I mean, you don't, and most people in our league now put an extra linebacker in and take a corner out. And I imagine you're about to see that. If you aren't seeing it, you're getting ready to see it. So I don't like that. What I want to do is I want to develop a system where I still have two wides, still can run keepers, which I think is the best play for four-minute offense, there is. I mean, because they, they start gambling, trying to stop your run, and you can put away games. You can get in the red zone, you can get into plus territory, and you can score points. You can put that same pressure in short yardage. We run short yardage offense out of force element rather than out of two tights, two backs, because we want that threat always present uh, in how we teach it. Does that make sense? And so when I talk about wide zone weak, wide zone strong, I also talk about wide zone force weak, wide zone force strong. And they're a big part of the whole thing. They, they structure and give us a way to run the same blocking schemes and everybody be tied to the same things. Now, does that, does that give us a little bit of, of wide zone, or do we need some questions before I go to pass? Okay, okay. Now, our inside three have to be brilliant. They have to be brilliant. Uh, I spend all my time making them make a decision because of shifts, because of shades, because of how they adapt on defense to is he inside or outside, you see? So everything we do comes out of the core of those three guys deciding on the blocking scheme that we're going to use collectively. And they base that on the kind of guy they are, uh, what kind of talent they have, you know, how, how much ability they have, and they make the call. They, they totally structure the call themselves. I get pissed if they can't tell me why they did it the way they did it. I don't care as much that they did it perfectly as that they knew why they did what they did. And, and so I demand that they either work in unison or they work with somebody behind. And, and the lead horse will come out of that group. Usually our center makes it, but our guards have to be able to see threes and twos. They've got to see is, is the stance of the body uh, going in, going out, sitting off. Is he, is he running a loop stunt or is he, you know, they got to make the decision off those things. So we have calls for every one of those things that have to be made. I do not allow and will never allow a player to block a picture without a call. I cannot stand that. I want it called. And they have, uh, they have code words they use. They make up things. But there's a system in place. And I don't let them fuck with that system when they're going through training camp and going through early season. Once the season starts and you decide the same guy all the time, then it doesn't bother me as much. Now, if the guard's uncovered, then he's now pushing it to the to one on his outside. So he's controlling the tackle. The only time our tackles are controlled is 
He controls the tight end into the combinations like those bubbles where I told you there's a bounce look. Uh, that's, that's the tackle controlling the tight end. And that's to this look right here. He is controlling how we're blocking that. And so his calls in combination are telling those guys how to do it. Okay? I'll give you one cheat here that I think is, is unbelievable. It's just started in pro ball, and some of you can use this. But one of the things to that defense that's happening, we usually see Sam A in strong safety down when we see that. That's the same as a wheel backer in A with the weak safety down, right? Or weak side rotation. It's the same combination. One of the things that's happening now with force is this. And let me tell you why. Defensively, when your tight end releases outside, the safety in theory can't, he got a problem, he got, he got to decide. So the combination of these two blocking schemes together is really disjointing defenses. You need a word that tells you the fullback has the force element or the tight end has the force element to a reduction side strength. And you talk about putting people in a crack, now that puts them in a crack because they don't know where to defend the release of the tight end. And then suddenly the tight end's knocking it off the ball and the force element's coming out of the fullback. And it's the same motion, same formation, same read, same everything. Does that make sense? Now, let me hit keepers one more time. Uh, guys, the worst thing you can do about keepers is only running them when you have a tight end releasing or a back releasing to the flat. That's, that's, that's 10 years ago, okay? Some of the best keepers I see today from some of you guys in college and from people in pro ball, this, this to me is one of the most unbelievable ones, is you motion them over here and run wide zone over here and come back to keeper and keep your tight end in and start your draggers and your cross stunts off that. Now you talk about people having fucking fits now. Because they want to defend a keeper where somebody throws down and he goes out in the flat. Well, fuck, that's where it started. Or the fullback slows down and he comes back. Do them to open edges. Do them to uh, a tight end and nobody over there. Uh, do them when there's no backs over there. It, it, there is a keeper for everything. And we don't go into game. We have more keepers than we have runs. Uh, it, it's, it's the best part of our running game, in my opinion. Because the quarterbacks have the best protection and they got to decide what to defend. Don't ever throw out a formation and say, we can't put one in there. And you go to Nichols and wide open formation, shit, I mean, fuck, they're unbelievable to me. Because now they got to say, somebody's going to stay back there. And uh, I don't think it necessarily always has to be a running kind of guy. Obviously, the runner presents another threat. But the thing that we're doing so much in our league now is what we call stays, where the element on the back side of it doesn't go out. So we ran wide zone weak, came out here, he stayed, and now you got receivers running crossers with a full live running game, and now he's holding the ball. I mean, he's not throwing a dink down. He's throwing scissors and Cadillac routes and, and shit like that. That, to me is a hell of a lot easier than taking a seven-step drop and pumping that fucking ball three times. Now, I'm going to tell you, because you, you've done it off what you do, and you don't matter about the downs, it doesn't matter when it is, and now they're heading in the nickels just constantly uh, doing those things. So I, I think they tie to the run, zone running game, and I would, I would tell you to study some people that are doing those, because I see some of you doing some really interesting things with those. And, and we don't hesitate to steal those. Uh, just, you know, watching some of the, some of the teams. And Joey Hamilton, now Georgia Tech, two years ago, we won't throw those films away. He fucking drove everybody crazy with all that stuff. Well, those, those, those are what we're looking for. Those are some great ideas and some great points. Anything else about zone? Okay. Basically, what I, I don't, I'm not a drop step guy because I don't want penetration, but I tell them that they take their lead foot, and if it's wide zone, I want to take my helmet 
and I want to put my helmet where his helmet is. If his helmet moves, then I have to adjust it. So if I'm a guard uncovered, you saw Slareth there a number of times, he, he takes his foot and he opens it up. He doesn't drop it, he opens it up, and he aims for that spot of the defender's face if he's uncovered. If he's covered, he's working outside half. So he comes off with enough hesitation to get the center with him, but he is only working on outside leverages when he has inside help. When our guards push out and then climb to backers, that's the same technique we teach our tackles to do to tight ends. Push out and climb up. So the teaching is exactly the same. When we teach our center to gap onside 4-3, and if I'm going too fast, some of you just slow down, God damn it! I don't know what you're talking about. I, this is, this is my life and this is all. That combination and angle is identical to that combination and angle. That hat and that hat and that combination is the same. So that aiming spot is the helmet of the defender. And if you have help, then you stay on the outside half. If you're tight in the outside half. If you're a guard and the center's going outside half. You stay on the outside half of your player. We buy enough time there to get him with us. So you see our tackles don't take off quite as fast when the guards are coming with them. Our tight ends don't take off as fast. We wait for that guy to get into us so we can work them together. Okay? Now obviously if, if you're working outside half and your half moves, you got to adjust. If it goes in, you tighten down. If it goes out, you widen out. You still have the outside half of that person. So when our tackles work this combination, they got that half. They got that half tight end, left guard. You got the half of him that exists. If his half widens, you widen. If his half goes in, you tighten. You stay on that leverage point to not allow the penetration so the runner could stay on the downhill path. Now, I know you say a couple times there, you have to say, well, that runner does, it's taking us a few pause steps. But you gotta remember how hard this is to force them to do something they've never been told to do. I promise you, your runner's never been told what to read and what to look at. And we get them, and it is so hard for us to get them and, and teach them something that nobody's ever told them. But if you stop to think about it, who the fuck shouldn't be coaching a runner? You know, I mean, just because he's a good player doesn't mean he can't get coached. Shit, the guards don't come off the right spots. They're too wide, they're not tight enough, they're not wide. And, and yet we don't say anything to the runner. Fuck that. I can't stand that. It just, it just galls my ass. I mean, that, that, that guy needs to know, I don't want to stutter step, and I want to hit the scene. We ain't blocking them all, baby. You better get in there. We're going to give you what we got. Now get up. Get on in there. And it's, I think it's out of that unison that it ties together. Is that a decent answer on landmarks? Um, you know, I'm a, a fist guy, a hand fist. I, I constantly harp on tight elbows. I, I think the biggest mistake you guys make is a lot of you do those windmill wrap-ups. When arms are out, hands are out. When elbows are in, hands are in. Uh, we don't get many holding calls, and we hold like shit. Okay, we hold like hell. Boy, I mean, we hold. I promise you. But we hold here. We don't hold here. We don't let our elbows out of our body frame. I have a hard time getting your guys teaching them that because they all want to do these wind-ups. And those wind-ups have hands out here. You don't block people with your hands outside. You block people with your hands inside. Some of my guys use fists. Some of my guys use open hands. But this is their tool right here. This is what they have to have. They have to have hand strength. And I, I, I get so pissed at those weight coaches because they say, well, fuck, he's the strongest guy you got. I said, shit, the guy can't hold nobody. I, you teach them to hold in there, in there. Don't, don't teach them to bench press. Fuck, when's the last time I bench pressed somebody out there on the field? But I hold all the time in there. I want them to know where to get their hands and have strength in their hands. And, and th those guys are strong. And, and I don't care. I don't have any big guys. I don't have fat guys. I don't, I don't have any, but I got a lot of strong-handed guys. I mean, they got strong hands, and they can run good enough to cut off, and that, that, that's where we live with the world, okay? Now, am I saying that you guys can get by with smaller players than you're, you're taking out of high school? I, I'm not gonna tell you how to do yours, because I know you're under the same pressure I got. I was under many years in pro ball, but I think you can be too tall. When they get over 6'6", I don't like them. 
I don't like anybody over 6'6", six, 6'5". Six, six, They're too tall. They, have, they lose leverage. And my inside players, I don't like them over 6'2 and a half. I don't like tall guys. I like length, but I don't like height. Uh, enormous height. 6'8 players. I don't see many 6'8", 6'9 guys. I've had a couple, but I don't see many of those guys. But I see a whole bunch of good athletes, you know, that were high school linebackers that are 6'2", 250, that can play guard for me now. That's, that, that's what I'm looking for. I, I'm looking for a leverage strength hand guy. And as a result, I'm lucky because in the draft, they're all down there and they all think they're too small. I just eat those guys up. Uh, fifth, sixth, seventh round, I'll just take a couple of years and redshirt them and do 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 here we go. If his half widens, you widen. If his half goes in, you tighten. You stay on that leverage point to not allow the penetration so the runner could stay on the downhill path. Now, I know you say a couple times there, you have to say, well, that runner does, it's taking a few Paul steps. But you gotta remember how hard this is to force them to do something they've never been told to do. I promise you, your runner's never been told what to read and what to look at. And we get them, and it is so hard for us to get them and, and teach them something that nobody's ever told them. But if you stop to think about it, who the fuck shouldn't be coaching a runner? You know, I mean, just because he's a good player doesn't mean he can't get coached. Shit, the guards don't come off the right spots. They, they're too wide, they're not tight enough, they're not wide, and, and yet we don't say anything to the runner. Fuck that, I can't stand that. It just, it just galls my ass. I mean, that, that, that guy needs to know, I don't want a stutter step and I want to hit the scene. We ain't blocking them on, baby, you better get in there. You, we gonna give you what we got, now get up, get on in there. And it's, I think it's out of that unison that it ties together. Is that a decent answer on landmarks? Um, you know, I'm a, a fist guy, a hand fist. I, I constantly harp on tight elbows. I, I think the biggest mistake you guys make is a lot of you do those windmill wrap-ups. When arms are out, hands are out. When elbows are in, hands are in. Uh, we don't get many holding calls, and we hold like shit. Okay, we hold like hell. Boy, I mean, we hold. I promise you. But we hold here. We don't hold here. We don't let our elbows out of our body frame. I have a hard time getting your guys teaching them that because they all want to do these wind-ups. And those wind-ups have hands out here. You don't block people with your hands outside. You block people with your hands inside. Some of my guys use fists. Some of my guys use open hands. But this is their tool right here. This is what they have to have. They have to have hand strength. And I, I, I get so pissed at those weight coaches because they say, well, fuck, he's the strongest guy you got. I said, shit, the guy can't hold nobody. I mean, teach them to hold in there, in there. Don't, don't teach them to bench press. Fuck, when's the last time I bench pressed somebody out there on the field? But I hold all the time in there. I want them to know where to get their hands and have strength in their hands. And, and those guys are strong. And, and I don't care. Yet, I don't have any big guys. I don't have back. I don't, I don't have any. But I got a lot of strong-handed guys. And they got strong hands. And they can run good enough to cut off. And that, that, that's where we live with the world. Okay? Now, am I saying that you guys can get by with smaller players than you're, you're taking out of high school? I, I'm not going to tell you how to do yours because I know you're under the same pressure I got. I was under many years in pro ball. But I think you can be too tall. When they get over 6'6", six, six, I don't like them. I don't like anybody over 6'6", six, 6'5". Six, six, They're too tall. They, have, they lose leverage. And my inside players, I don't like them over 6'2 and a half. I don't like tall guys. I like length, but I don't like height. Uh, enormous height. Six, eight players. I don't see many six, eight, six, nine guys. I've had a couple, but I don't see many of those guys. But I see a whole bunch of good athletes, you know, that were high school linebackers that are 6'2", 250, that can play guard for me now. That's, that, that's what I'm looking for. I, I'm looking for a leverage strength hand guy. As a result, I'm lucky because in the draft, they're all down there and they all think they're too small. I just eat those guys up. Uh, fifth, sixth, seventh round, I'll just take a couple of years and redshirt them and do do do. Here we go. And coach them just like you do your young ones, because it's the same process. I really think, I think it has a lot to do with it. Okay. Any more questions about that force element? 
That's a bigger world if you can run it. Now, if you're totally a throw team and you're, you're seeing nothing but two deeps and outside rotations, and you don't need to worry about that world. But we're not in that world. Uh, we want to be 50-50 because of the way we teach. Yes, sir. Okay, now here's basically what I teach. All right. Uh, first of all, I'll be, I'd be lying to you if I told you that I know exactly what that measures out to because I don't know. I never got with them yardsticks and all that shit. I just look out there and get up, get up, get up, get up. So it, it's about 18 inches all across the front. The biggest violators we have are our tight ends. Our tight ends want to get too tight to our tackles. I don't like that. They step on each other. I also think the biggest mistake most of you make in short yards and goal lines, you get foot to foot. You step on each other. Don't, don't do that. You know, go down to eight, ten inches, but nah, damn. You can't, you can't come off the ball when you've got to step on another guy's feet. I think that's overdone. I move up, but I don't. And I put my uh, hands, my guard's hands, go down on the shoelace of the center. So I'm 18 inches shoelace of the center, and that gives me an angle to handle studs, I think, that I'm happy with comfortable with. Now I know I hear people say, well the holes would be bigger if you'd widen them out there. I said, yeah, you're right. They would be. They would be. So would them motherfucking penetrations I'm going to get too. Okay? And, I, and I'm honest about that. I, I mean, I, open them up. Boy, there'll be big ass holes. Yeah, there'll be some big ass holes in there. I know that I can zone block if I work the shoulders uh, off those combinations. Does that answer that? So everybody's basically right on the legal line. Um, my open tackle's always in an up stance. I know a lot of you don't. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to sell you that that way, but I want a p pass protector on the open edge, and I want him up. So he run, learns to run block from an up stance for me, and I do a lot of that. I don't allow guards up ever, uh, but the tackle on an open edge always has the option of being up, and they almost always do. If they're double edges, then I'm double up, okay? And we still run the ball weak, as you can see. Now, the reason that I put weak zone, a lot of teams don't teach weak zone, is because of zone dogs. Now, the zone dogs are based on safety support and linebacker bubbles. So the best way to attack zone dog teams is to go away from the bubbles and away from the zone dogs, right? Uh, it doesn't only make sense. It's also why we love slot, because they don't like to fucking set those things with slot. It, it causes them a problem. They don't want to bring a safety down to the tight end side with slot away from the set. So the minute I figure out your zone dog system, I'm heading toward weaker strong zone, and the only strong zones I want to run are forced zones. Does that make sense? Because I got a safety and support. Or I want to get the slot where you have to sometimes check out of it. I, I want to format how you're going to set them and run away from those. And that's why we become so more, much more weak than strong. We run more weak zone than we run strong zone. We do not run enough strong zone. And we let zone dogs run us out of it. Same thing's true, I'm sure, in your protection schemes, which I'm going to talk about. Because you can no longer duel strong in the NFL to a bubble. You can't do it. Your quarterback's going to get killed. You can't do that. You have to have another way to do it. And I'm going to talk about that when we get into it. But it's a big part of zone running. So I love to come out, move the fullback around and have slot. Or create slot with motion with the fullback weak. Okay? I don't like affirmation for the runner. Just so you know. I don't think you can run wide zone and have a guy in front of a guy's face. You can if you bounce. If you G down, text around, and you bounce the play, the fullback can be there. But if the runner's doing what I want him to do, I want the picture clear. I do not like wide zone out of eye formation. I like to get an eye and move him, but I don't like to run wide zone. I don't think it's fair to the runner because I'm going to be hard enough making the right read. I'm going to be demanding about that. Okay, what else, sir? All right, then I'm going to jump on over here to talk about pass protection. All right. Um, In the NFL today, and I'm sure it's that way in college because I see them, and I see my son, and he's, he's the worst zone dog guy I ever fucking saw in my life. But you can't, you can't let this happen to your quarterback, be it weak or strong, 
and not have an answer, okay? I mean, don't say that guard's got both them fucking guys coming around there and you're gonna drop back and throw that ball now. You can't do that. You just, and that's uh, old fashioned football coaches that popped them out or zoned them out, however you do them. Um, you, got, you got two guys coming and you, got, and you ain't got enough guys blocking, okay? Now, one of the things that's happening in our league, and I'll share with you, is over here, there's a lot of tight end check. He just pause checks. Okay, he reads the guy on him, he pause checks and goes. So that the quarterback, if you were running that protection where the back is weak, are we all same, and I don't care whether it's shotgun or motions or shit, if your back's over here and he's got that one, we check step that guy instead of Molly in the guard or fan in the guard. We, we just don't, we don't want the quarterback hit him there. So that, that's one answer. The second answer, and this is the one that's coming very fast, is you wrap your back. So if the back were going strong or the back were going weak and he felt too strong, he comes back over to the weak side of the edge. Okay? Now, we do it this way. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying what we do. And this is an answer. And if you're into this world, you'd understand it. But our tackles fan in our system. And our guards snap that one to that one, and the back takes that one. Okay, so if he were coming this way, our tackle would have the wheel. Our guard would snap the end and take the backer, and that back would wrap around and have that end when I snapped him down in there. Now, here's how we do it. The, the runner is, again, overloaded with teaching. So it's hard now. It's not easy. It's obviously easier with our fullback than our tailback because they're a little better blockers, usually. So he immediately sees reduction on his side. He has, in theory, the reduced linebacker to safeties. And the very minute he doesn't see the thing, look, he immediately gets his eyes weak side. When he goes, he goes back to weak A, weak A gap. And we coach our guards. When that end comes down, just snap the end to him and take the linebacker. We used to like try to wrap the back all the way around, but he couldn't get over there. He couldn't get over there. The linebacker had too much head of steam. So we snap the end to the back. Sometimes the backs cut them, sometimes they don't. Depends on quarterback depths. But that's answer number two to it. Your back can't read and check out. He's got to read, read, and check out. Does that make sense? The tight end can't go. He's got to check and go. All right? Now, personally, I hate to go beyond that stage because I think the best passing games don't have people staying in. I'd rather our quarterback know he's in trouble and dump the ball down and dump the hot and have a route to throw than to keep him in. If I had my way, we wouldn't keep anybody in. I'd take all of them. But the quarterback has to be a part of that philosophy. A lot of times, the quarterback coach and our head coach want a way to work the ball deep. So to work the ball deep, they got to get the maximum protections. I don't like that. I personally would rather see people out. And I know I'm in a I'm in a big minority in this room saying those things, but I really believe that. I don't, I don't worry as much if the quarterback knows he's got a problem. Where I think it's a hard for the quarterback is when he doesn't know. Is it, am I hot or not? Have I, have I got enough people or not? See, that's what I don't like. I don't like that. I want that some bitch to say, oh, shit, here they come. She's gone. And then when there's four or five that he knows I can deal with, I deal with. Does that make sense? Now to do that, I have to take these smart guards and teach a system. I don't know what you call it, but I teach a system we call SCAT. If we were sliding away from that right guard, okay, and we had no backs, we tell that right guard he's got two. We tell that quarterback, you better get that fucking ball from me. All right? So this right guard sitting there, and he's going to snap that one and take that one or that one and take that one by himself. Now, I see a lot of you try that, pull the tackle back and read this shit. Well, you go play tackle, and you find out about that goddamn thing. That don't work, guys. That don't, that don't work. That may look good. That may be all right on Thursdays and Wednesdays, but that don't work. The hardest job, besides playing quarterback in football, is a tackle blocking a wide rusher. Leave those fuckers alone. 
Don't give them any more jobs. Don't give them any more fucking hats. The hardest job beside playing quarterback, bar none, is a right or left tackle blocking a wide rush athlete that's much better than he is. So I don't ever tell that guy, oh, you look to him, to him, then fuck that. I don't do that. I, I, don't, I don't believe that. But I think I can take one of them sawed off guards of mine that are smart as shit and say, you snap that bastard, you get that bastard, you choke them both. And quarterback, throw the ball. And that's the way we teach that. We are always in a slide system one way or the other. I don't believe in popping people. And I, again, I know some of you would disagree with me, and I, I, don't, I don't really care. But if I came out and saw a balanced look, and I had two people, and I had no backs, or the back is motioned, or he's not there, I'm going to slide and go three on three on one side, and my guard's got two on the other. But I never fuck with that tackle, ever, because it's too hard. It's just too hard. Now, I know some of you try, and I understand all that, but I just don't do that. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, they, they occasionally on uh, some five-steppers talk me into doing this, where he goes from that one back to that one. But here's what I try in my mind, and I, I'm, I'm going to be quite honest. I, I tell our people that we are going to always win on one side or the other. Hopefully, I'm smart enough to be turning to the right people. Hopefully, our game plan got me my best against their best or my three on their two. So I'd rather have a winner side than to be able to sit there and tell the quarterback, well, we might get back there or we might not get back there. What I'd rather tell the quarterback is, okay, you hear us going that way, that motherfucker over there comes, you better throw that ball. I feel safe for them. I, I just feel safe. And then I tell my lineman, you better find a way that they can't get to him quickly. Okay? Now, if I'm tied to a back, then the only compromise I make, and I see most of you doing this occasionally, I, I'll, I'll turn a film on and you don't. But if anybody ever gets in the gap away from our slide, our guard has that guy. He, that guy ain't going to hit our quarterback now, okay? And our back now has my guy. And you have to work at that. I don't worry as much about the ones that show. The ones that scare me the most come out of secondary, like a weak safety, and here he comes running down. Now, that's the ones that scare me, because sometimes my guys don't see those very good. But I tell them a running guy is a bigger threat than a fucking guy lined up in there. But I don't let that guy ever get in there. I don't care whether we're in gun or not gun. I, I don't care. I, I, don't, I don't want that guy creating our quarterback having to speed up before he can speed up. So the back has yours and you have his and you make a decision. And, you know, and I hear all that, well, we're going to call out a word. Fuck the word. Dude. You start playing them games, you don't hear no goddamn words now. So we tell our guard, if there's a guy in there, you take that guy. And if he doesn't, you come back and get your guy. And back, you stay with me till I get it done. We have to work at that. That isn't easy. But we don't change the side of our slide. Whichever way we declare, we go. We don't pop guards. And I, I know a lot of you believe in that because I see it on your films. Uh, guys, I, I know this is hard to coach, but I promise you I can take these two guys and block those three a whole bunch easier. And you can do that and block those two with that guy. I mean, I, I, I know I can. I don't think. I know. Now, where you don't like it is you don't have one guy to blame now. You got two. And I know your problem. You'd like to say, hey, Jimmy, you fucked it up. You, you, you got that one. No, no, you got that one. Yeah. See, I don't do that. I fan everything. I open shoulder, keep people together. That's why I don't like to pop the center. I think I'm going to win damn near every time if I can set like that. I call that slide, and I have a word going left and a word going right, and I actually take slot of most of the times in those slides. I create a slot rule based on certain elements so that the quarterback sometimes never even has to look over there. And most people won't do that, and I'm not telling you that's easy because that's hard. 
but there's a lot of times that we're in slot because of our run and throw, and we don't want the quarterback hot off a guy coming off slot. We don't want it. So we will turn that kick sometimes all the way to that slot defender. But we believe in three working together or two working together and not the other way around. Okay? Does that make sense on slide? All right, now let's talk about stunts real quick. Yes, sir. Against what? Okay. We, we, have two, we have two systems in this. I assume you're talking about a bear defense of some sort, like so. Is that where you are? Okay. We have two systems. We go, we go down and the back has the edge, or we go out and the back has everybody else. All right? Yeah, they're double scattered if there's no back. So if anybody else came, both guards are now double bumpers. You with me there? If I had no back. If I had no back. And I'm going to go to that in just a second and talk about that. But I believe you go down and the back has the one on his side, or you go out and the back has all the others. I don't like the back to check out on that defense. I will tell you that. And I raise immortal hell. If I got five one-on-ones and he's doing a fucking check down, I, I get nervous about that because that's hard right there. Now, that, there, it doesn't take but one slip of the tongue there. So I, I ask them to stay with me, at least bump their way through on that, that defense. The same with nickel. I mean, it's the same, it's the same concept because I don't want to change uh, the way they're taught there if I can get it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about stunts just a second. Because I, I think I can help you here. I, I really do. I, I think we have as close to the answer as there is. We teach our guards, our guards, if slide is going away from you, if slide is going away from you, so let's assume in this picture it's going that way. We tell this guard, he has two base kicks, and I'll talk about the kicks when I start talking about pass pro, but I'm talking about stunts now. If that guy ever makes an out charge, he snaps it immediately. He doesn't read anything. If a man on his outside and slide is going away, goes on his outside shoulder, he snaps it right now, immediately. If the guy makes an in charge, he closes the in charge. He washes him or he hooks him up or whatever he's got to do to be a defender for the, for, the, for the box. But if that guy goes out, he is going to snap that guy right there. If when he snaps, there is no stunt, then he closes the snap. Sometimes he closes it by cutting. Sometimes he closes it by re-engaging. But he closes the snap after the snap. Okay. Our tackles are taught to read stance, tightness, whatnot, and we always have a drag arm in our kick. Now, we're in an up stance on the edge, just so we're clear there again, but our inside hand, if I'm at left tackle, is always in a drag alignment. The snap and the drag go together so that the TE stunt, guys, is stopped before it ever starts because at our place, you go out, we're snapping your ass right to the tackle. If the guy outside didn't run it, then I close the guy, I'm going to snap. Now, I don't ride. I don't ride and read now. I snap that fucker right now. Does that make sense? Now, if he goes in, i got to defend. Now, he goes in here, or he's into me, or he's into there, or he's step clubbing or doing whatever he's doing, then he's mine. i got to now work with the center on a looper coming back around. i gotta, I got to deal with all those things. But you, you can understand what I'm, what I'm building right there. But you've got to stop this stunt first. This stunt right here has got to be stopped before you do anything else. And the only way to do it that I know is to snap the thing. And the tackle must always have his drag hand because if he gets on his back elbow, he's a dead duck. So his hand has to go from there to there in his kick. Always there. All right? Now, when we coach our guards, we coach our guards that you either set in your shoes or you up kick. We don't back up. All right? 
if I'm sitting in my shoes, I'll snap that sucker right now. If I'm up kicking, I'm swallowing him, or we may end up manned up without a call. A lot of times we pre-tell them when we're up kicking. Now, let me, let me just say this, because you guys could, could save yourself a lot of headaches if you teach your guys how to up kick in pass pro. Uh, you, need, you need to get a veteran player that's been in the NFL, a guy that's been through a system that understands it. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't sit there and wait on them anymore, guys. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't wait. You can't, you can't let them know where you're going to be. So basically, they stay in their shoes and they fight the fight or they up kick. Now an up kick for us is either foot, both hands, and we go get them right now. And we choke them. I mean, we're going to choke them. And what I want the guy not to know is, is it going to be an up kick or is he going to sit in his shoes? I want them to not know, just like they want us to not know, is it this stunt, is it that stunt? You cannot play passive and sit there and get the shit beat out of it. You got to give you guys a tool. And that tool is, is, is an up-kick world. How do you up-kick a three-beer event? Uh, an outside three? Like three flashes I, I'm gonna, uh, he ain't going to have time to flash now. Because I'm going to tell you, I, it's damn near a run block with my head not in it. And I'm going to try to swallow him as best I can. I'm going to try to swallow him up. And the best blockers in our league up-kick probably half the time. Uh, the young ones, maybe a third of the time. But the ones I get from you guys, they don't know what that means. And they come in and they stick their hands out there and these fucking old veterans are just chopping the shit out of their hands. They, it's just embarrassing. And then they realize that if I keep sticking them out there, they're going to get them, you know, even if I'm sitting in my shoes. So I've got to have a way where he doesn't know what I'm doing. Now, you got to remember, this is slide away. If I got slide to me, we teach a system. And I'm sure you have your own way of teaching exactly how to go three on two. I, don't, I wouldn't even get into that because I think there's a lot of ways to teach it. I don't think, but boy, I, I teach my guys to up kick. Now, when our tackles are covered, we up kick everybody. Because a heavy five or an inside four is asking to not know run from pass. Well, we don't back up nobody. And we're going to swallow them some bitches immediately. And some of the veteran players, the really veteran, smart, outside players at tackle actually have two systems of up kick that they're using today. Some of them will drop one step and immediately go get them. Now, I know you're going to say, you can't do that. I'm telling you. Some of them are so tired of dropping back there and getting the shit beat out of them that they say, fuck that. And you have to work it. You have to put them in one-on-one -on -one and be willing to let them get embarrassed a little bit and let them feel what it feels like. The newest thing that has come on has come on about five, six years ago. It appeared to me five or six years ago, and I've been doing this for a long, long time, okay? And, and the guy that brought it to me, um, uh, his name is Harry Swain, just a guy, a name, not, not a big name, but a guy. But what he, what he taught us to do is to start our kick so that we've got a pause and a half in our kick and then up kick. Now, you talk about one that'll fracture because he has no clue it's coming now. So the point of entry of every, every rusher is a certain spot, and you study that guy and you study that spot. So he wants that spot to be right there. And so what you're doing, you're starting him into that entry spot, and then, boom, you're right now starting your up kick from a delayed set. And that is a craze today. The really good players are using it constantly. Some of them are even headbutting with it. I'm not good at that. I got one player that's, that's doing it that I'm trying to steal from him, but the players don't want to talk about it because it's so new and it's so different. The pass rushers are frustrated. And so what you end up with, you end up with a bunch of players on your team that say, you know, my guys don't whine so much about throwing the ball because they say, hey, Alex, I'm going after his ass. Okay, baby. We're going to play today, we're going to play. We're going to all get to play, okay? So we use all of those sets. We're also a big cut team. All our three-step drops are cuts. Our head coach hates it. He wants to fire me every week because I can't always get them down. But I promise you, they're worried about it. That's a part of that kick that I talked to you about that Harry Swain taught us because the kick to there is the cut kick. His starts out and then goes up kick. 
And there's a lot of that being done to get hands down, open windows, allow quarterbacks to dump the balls down. Now, you've got to be careful with those in five-step drops, and you can't do them in sevens. You just can't do them. But, but the threes, it is another wheel to give your guys a chance to say, fuck that getting beat up. I ain't going to sit back there and let them beat me up like that. So what, I, what I'm trying to sell them on is, hey, hey, hey we get to play. We're going to play this damn thing. You, 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 you know, you want to get right? We're going to get tough. But, but I'm tired of being the catcher, you know, and especially one of those where you put it up there 45, 50 times. Son of a bitch. You get the hell beat out of you. And what, I don't know about your guys. My guys never leave the game. I mean, I had four guys that never missed a snap. I only played, you know, 18 times. They never missed a snap. And that fucking defense, what's happening? Second down. Here they come. Three more. Fourth down. Third down. Two more. Four more. Six more come running in there. And, 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 and you're, you're putting your guy where he's getting, he's, he's frustrated. So, I mean, we have just totally changed our concept. And it has not, it has not made us uh, worse or better. It's just given our guys more confidence in what they're doing. And I really believe in that. The length of the tackle is the key. Uh, you can't let them, if they can get to your shoulders, you, you have no chance. So that is arm length. When I talked about needing length, I need length. I don't need height, I need length. Length does go with height. That's why I think a guy playing tackle at under 6'4 has the hard time of ever having length. So on our level, I like a guy 6'4", 6'5", that has, you know, the arm that keeps the defender from being able to grab the back shoulder and pull. Okay? They changed that on me a couple years ago. I can't grease them up anymore. And so I tried that and got turned in and all that stuff. But uh, I, I need length to keep them off the arms when I play on the outside. On the inside, I don't think length has anything to do with it. I think it's all balance and toughness in there. Uh, they got to, they got to, they got to be able to move around and bounce around because it's going to get ugly. And as I said, we are setting heavy and firm on the inside of all those boxes with a lot of up kicks. And then the slide side, obviously, we should win because we don't have pop at angles. We just, we want that balanced up as as hard as we can on the inside. Okay. Okay, uh, as I said, everybody teaches it different. We teach the guard to the side of slide if he's covered by three, like the gentleman just said. We teach our guard to open his hip and extend his inside arm. He never moves his inside foot. So he takes the outside half of the three technique and he reads backer to in. Our center comes right now, provided he didn't cover it. If he's covered, he drags. He drags off the shade and he comes right now and takes the inside half of that guy. If that guy disappears outside, he stops because he knows something's coming back in there. But our, our guards set and take half man with vision outside. I do not allow the inside three just to block the inside two. That's a no-no at our place, okay? Our guards read backer to end. So our tackles to the side of slide always gamble on outside edge. They gamble on outside edge because they know the guard's there for them. A lot of times they up kick when they have slide because they say, fuck, if I screw it up, he'll get him. All I got to do is turn him into it. So a lot of times our tackles to the side of slide are really aggressive but never beat high because the guard will only help him inside half. Okay, now the, the common problems with that when you use those kind of slides is they slap your inside hand out because you're not looking at him. You're looking at backer to end, the backer you've declared or the slot you've declared. And so when you put your inside arm inside on him and look out, he'll knock that down. And we have to go through a lot of training of getting it knocked down and sticking our asses back in there because you can't ever get your arm back to it. You can't get to it. So we put a half arm, read backer to end, he slaps it, I bust my butt, still looking to the outside edge. And our tackles gamble to the side of slide. That also prevents the rusher from knowing where the fuck the tackles are going to be. Because their kicks are totally different to slide than they are away from slide. 
Does that make sense? So that's the way we do it. Now, if the center's, if the center's got one behind him, he drags off that guy because the stunt he's got to always deal with is the TT stunt, and it's almost always the three first. So he wants to pull the one on to him. So if we were sliding left and we had a shade on that side, he'll drag that one knowing that that's coming at some point, and he just wants to hold off that back edge. He's still got the inside half of that three to slide left. Okay? Now, how many of you are popping? I'm sure some of you are. I mean, I'm sure Jimmy Crickets. How many of you Molly Block and pull the guard out of there? Well, as I tell you, if you ever get them the other way, they'll never go back. I promise you that. But it's hard. It's hard because you as a coach have to coordinate it, and it's hard to teach, but that's, that's the way we teach it. Okay, now. I want, I want to go from there into the play action game for just a second, because I think then I've tied together all three of these. I think I've given you a few ideas and, and drop back. And then I want to go to this play action, and then I want to end up with empty. And then I'll get, I'll get out of your hair. Uh, by empty, I'm talking about no backs, because you all ought to play with this. You ought to play with it. Okay, our play action protections, we want them to carry over. We, I hate to do pass protection in play action that doesn't mean something. So I want to turn very similar to the way I do in drop back. I want cross teaching here. Sometimes I can't get it if it's a zone play action because now we're manned up. When we zone play action, we sell it. We go get it. We just live and die, just like I'm sure you do. But if we have two backs weak or two backs strong, I want to teach it off the turn. I want to teach it off what I taught all those other things. Sliding two, declaring to slide. Two backs strong, two backs weak, play action, run game. So we spend a lot of time, but we, we want to be able to teach these so that nobody had to learn a new technique. Does that make sense? If we're in a zone play action, we're forced to because We've got to account for our people. One of the best zone formation running schemes is off that baby right there, where you got to sail over here, and some point back here, you got to be a little soft. I mean, you just have to be, because it's going to take too long to throw. Those are all seven-step play actions. Uh, they, they create the best separation for the quarterback there is in football, and you have to have them, but they got to be off runs you run, off things you do, off formations you do, not off things that don't make any sense. You don't need open edges when you do those things. You need run action edges that make it look like some kind of running game. This obviously could be the fullback side if you weren't in two tight ends so that you're doing the same thing you did on your zones. So you're teaching the same stuff, same, same assignments. You're just tightening down landmarks and creating those. Okay? Um, I don't like to throw passes that we don't have runs off of, but our coaches Put them in there, and I got to teach them. You know, we don't trap, and we run trap passes. That makes no fucking sense to me. But they put them in. I, I got to teach them. You know, uh, I know all of you are doing these things that have come on in pro ball, where you uh, free release your fullbacks into the flats and block with the tailback and turn the protection backside. I know you see all the pro teams doing. The college teams are doing a lot of those, and those are great if it's an action off of what they see you doing. Does that make sense? So those tie with what you are and what your philosophy is. All right? Now, there are two types of no backs. There's a type where you have the potential of getting nickel, and there's a type where you are going to get base because of who you got on the field. All right? So you have two totally different types in my opinion. If you've done it out of nickel, they should be ready to make checks very easily. Because if you've done it a number of weeks or they've seen it before, they're going to say, okay, they got 
five wide receivers or four wide receivers or one back and three receivers and a tight end, but it's their passing group. So it's very easy for them to set up a system of blitz in nickel, I think. We do it in both phases. So I'm not trying to talk you out of however you do it. The thing that we do, I think it's a little better than most of the people, is we always change the formations so that the defensive people don't know where the wideouts that are gifted are going to be. In other words, the formation may look like this. And it could be gun, you know, if you're a gun team. So that this may be the best receiver, and that may be, or these two may be, and the next week it's somewhere else. Now, the reason you do that is you want to be able to read coverage at quarterback. All right? So what you want to do is you want to try to somehow have your receivers on the inside. So the, in a perfect world, there's the perfect empty. I, I'm, I'm saying this is a quarterback, gun or not gun. All right? Now, why do I want these two to be receivers? Now, just think about this a second. Because if he's covered by the corner, it's man coverage. What's coming? It's blitz. Does that make sense? If he's covered by a linebacker, they ain't coming. Now, they may run a zone blitz, but they got a fucking hard time getting lined up in zone blitzes. Because the formation is something they've never seen. So one of the things you want to do if you do, if you do some of this is you want to get in formations and put them in different places, but you need your receivers on the inside. Now, what I do is then I determine what are the best blitzes that I see this team have, who are the individuals that are most apt to blitz, okay? For instance, I found that the middle linebacker is usually, in most teams, now when you play Baltimore, it's not that case, but uh, when you play most teams, the middle linebacker is the poorest blitzer. The wheelbacker or the sandbacker is the best blitzer. So I have a whole set of rules. My rules basically say that I have the four defenders in here, wherever they are, and then I have anybody that lined up in the box. And if there's no box, I'm now going to a guy, probably. Number 57, if they're going to fucking blitz, they're going to bring 57. They're going to bring 38. They're going to bring... And then I start sets of rules based on those guys. Our quarterback knows which way I'm going. And we go with that. Then the next week, we do it this way. Formation we run, and we motion him out. Now, who is their base? Blitz number one. That's the way I'm going to go. The next week, Pull back air, X, Z, the Y, and now I take the tail back out. I can create any one of these things, but I have a set of rules that the quarterback knows what I'm going to do. Now, we don't do those with digits. I don't know how you do them, if you're doing them. We don't declare it based on digits because we want it looked at when we get up there. So we simply use this word, and, and the word's no major deal, but we use key. And what we're saying to ourselves is we are keying the defense and we're going to go and the quarterback's going to hear which way we're going. And we're in turn on one side and we're in scat on the other. So what I taught way back there to you to start with is what I'm doing in every one of these. I just have told my center, all right, here's the way I'm going to do it this week. All right? Now, they come out. There's nobody in the box. Find Junior. Go to Junior. Okay. I come out, there's somebody in the box, declare the box. I come out and they have removed uh, that backer and that backer. Let's duel strong. Let's fan weak. Our quarterback knows what set of rules we're dealing with and we go from there. 
Now, I think it's a lot harder in nickel because who is on the field now? Best pass rushers. That makes sense? Because you already had what personnel out there? You got your receiver course. Now, your coordinator, he's going to love that fucking four wide because he can diagram all kind of shit. You know, that's great. That's great. But meanwhile, you got them four bastards that can pass rush, too. I like that big, fat nose guard that's playing, you know? I like him in there on those downs. I like the Mike Backer who, who can't, uh, they, they, they can't do things. I like the people on there that are playing heavy three techniques. I don't like any of those really gifted. So I'd rather do it in base, but we do it in both, and we mix them up, and we have some things we can't deal with and some that we do. But we teach turn and we teach scat. Now here's where our slot rule pays off for us. And I know when I said that, I saw some heads wiggle. But you see, we teach our turn protection to slot. That that's the wheel back. Okay. If he's in press, he's the wheel backer. That's the way we teach him. So when I go to empty, no backs, by motioning or shifting or whatever, I've already taught how to get out there because I've taught slot. Does that make sense? I teach slot from the get-go. Press coverage, turn protection, safety over the top, that's, that's, that's wheel. See, now my back has got this one and this one and that one. And I'm going to slot. So when there's nobody back here, and they've removed all these people with a flex tight end or whatever you had, and a back, and maybe the Z out here, and the X outside of a fullback, I can get to that one, and I can get to that one, because I've already trained them that way. I trained them that way in nickel, and I trained them that way in base. So when empty comes, if I don't have somebody that's a threat, a box player, an edge player, a person who has a number that I've identified, then I just simply get them declared to where the slots are. Then the quarterback knows, fuck, I ain't got no problems over there. My problems are all over there. Does that make sense? It, it, it really does smooth up the edges that you've taught. And then once you get into it, you just change them up every week. You had not changed, the quarterback changed. You got a different formation. You got a different empty. One week you motion. One week you might do it, you know. There, there are teams in the NFL that are doing it out of that heavy that I drew up a while ago with two tights, two backs. When I said I hate this formation, there are teams coming out with that grouping going empty. Guess why? Because what they do? Took one of the corners off the field, put a linebacker on the field, and now you disperse all that. And you got them, you got them wiggling a little bit right there now. But you don't have the best receivers on there. So your, your, your quarterback coach, he don't like that shit too good because... He wants, you know, he wants to run deep scissors and razor routes and, and all that. And God damn, you know, you're like, whoo, that looks pretty good because you can make a play right there. And now they've got to, they've got to take their practice time the next week and they've got to say, okay, now, if they have this personnel on the field, they can do this and they can do that. You see what I mean? You see what you just did their practice time? You made them do that. You may not do it for three weeks that way. You may not do it any the next week. But they've got to go dig up how you do empty. And the beautiful thing for us, I think, is that, guess what I don't? I taught turn and scat. I got a slot rule to the turn side. I don't give a shit where they line up. I got a rule. I'm going to follow those. Quarterback, they come over there, they get the ball thrown. We really have fewer sacks in those formations than I do when I keep the goddamn guys in. And I'm saying to myself, why are we doing this? Why are we keeping all these guys in? Because we want to throw a deep ball and make sure we're safe. We ain't safe. Fuck, they can always bring more than we got. I, I, I just rather, I just say, I've got them. You take them off. Get out of here. Go. Go run a rap. Does that, am I giving you a theory there that may be a little different than the way you feel? But your quarterback coach and you have to be on the same page. I mean, he's got to know where the fucking problems are coming from, and you've got to know what you can deal with and do. Okay. And again, another thing with that nickel, and I'm sure you're seeing it because I see those things on your fan. In nickel, you've got to deal with four-man fronts and three-man fronts. Where in base, base is base. You know what's on the field, right? 
That fucking nickel, they got all them three-man blitzes. I don't know what you're seeing there, but that is a goddamn headache. I mean, they're coming from everywhere. And now you got to decide which way do I turn. Do I double turn? You know, that, that gets, to me, hard. But as I said, we do some of all of those based on, you know, how we fit. We get it going, we stay with it. Okay? How about questions there in empties? Slot takes press, safety over the top. That's a slot call. You don't get the safety over the top. If I don't have safety outside the tackle, I call outside the tackle over the, over the top, and I have to have press coverage. If I don't have press coverage, I don't declare them ever, because they ain't going to blitz, in my opinion. Shit, the fucker ain't going to blitz from six yards off, so I don't declare them out there. And the quarterback hears my declaration. I make sure they know that they understand them. And then he knows which side I'm defending and which side he's hot. Okay. Now, we try to tell them in the route, his, his hot route may not be to the hot side. Uh, one of the things we're having the most success with is having a crosser and just giving ground away from the blitzer and throwing the crosser the ball because you know it's man coverage and just lead the guy. And he may not make anything, but he may also run by someone in the crossing route. So his hot may not be to the side of the blitz. I don't want that. I hear that shit, and, and, and our quarterback coach will come in there about every three weeks. I got it. I got to tell you where to go. I said, fuck that shit. I don't want to be told where to go. I mean, I get them damn guys going where we got to go. Now, what are my rules, and I'll get them. I, I don't see. To me, I've been in those games, and they got hit, and they got blurry-eyed, and they got all this, and they got all that. And I mean, I get in the game, they don't even call the protections right. You know? And we all have problems. But at least I got five guys that can work that shit out. You know, if one guy's cuckoo, the rest of them will get that son of a bitch straight. If that guy gets cuckoo, we, we all screwed up. So I don't buy that. I don't buy that him saying, over there, over there, okay? I don't do that. I don't do that. So it's, it's a set of terms, and I'm going to call it, and he's going to hear me call it, and it is over right then and there. And if they shift after I call them, I don't change it. If they move, I don't change it. Because what I want is five guys doing it together. And I want the quarterback to have heard what I said, and then let's go from there, and we'll take our chances. And go fight. Is that? I'm not saying that's right. I just what I, I feel comfortable there. I, I don't like that other thing because I mean, what happens if he goes up there and he don't say nothing? Now what the fuck am I gonna do? You know, I don't. I don't like. That. I, I've been through that. Yes, sir. Okay. If I got nickeled, if I got nickeled, here's the way I do it. I basically start out where I only have the inside five. This is, this is what I've gone to. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's the closest I've found. We got all kind of guys out here, okay? I'll put you in shotgun. I basically have these five people, okay? I call those tight zones. And the quarterback coach, he don't like that. He wants me to double fan that, to double slots, okay? No matter what they look like. Well, you gotta remember, double fans and double slots are set up for tight formations and for non-pass rush situations. They got nickel on the field, guys. It ain't like you fucking fanning first and 10 now. It ain't, it ain't the same deal. So here's, here's the compromise we've made. This call right here says that we got these together, all right? And if our tackle sees a blitzer that he thinks is coming, he simply turns to his guard and he tells his guard wide. Wide. The guard repeats that because now the center has lost that tight zone player because I'm now doing this. Okay? The quarterback is going to hear that I no longer can say I got that inside player because I'm now going to the outside player. Now, sometimes they bring them both. Okay? Now, what does my guard do? My guard does what I was training to that back before. I snap number one to number two. 
I ain't snapping to a back, I'm snapping to air, but at least I'm slowing the bastard down to get the ball thrown. Our tackles are responsible for making that wide call. Okay? If they ever make a wide call and they don't come, that's a hundred dollar fine. Right there. Practice and games. That fucker's coming, you make a wide call. He ain't coming, you keep your mouth shut. Because you have told, torn up the inside of your structure. You've torn it up. You see, you, you haven't given yourself a chance. So we put the hat on that guy right there. What about with three linebackers? Three dollar three linebackers. So you had this right here? We would leave that same. And any time we make the term tight in a, in a dual scheme like that, it would not matter which one of those came. We would sit tight. So the center would snap off number one to number two, and we'd be okay. Two to the side, we'd still be okay because the guard would take one of them, the center would take the other. So no matter how they came inside, that would not bother me. What bothers me is when they bring this one off the edge and that one and pinch that in and then zone those. That's what scares me. And that creates a wide call and the guard's got to snap it off and the ball's got to go. I didn't, I didn't solve all the problems, but I have an answer. As I said, that's why I like base empty. I like base people out there. They can't get all that shit straightened out on defense. They can't get them all lined up. But, I mean, I'm like you, uh, some of you, you know, that whatever they tell us we're going to go do, we're going to go do. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like that, but that's the way it happens. What happens if the check is wide and all of a sudden it drops off? And it We're fucked. That's why it's a $100 fine. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's not fair. I mean, uh, yep. It is, it is, but you know, one thing I've, I've learned about checking and calling, I used to do this. I'd say, I don't care what, on short yardage, we're going to do this blocking scheme. And then I got wise and I said, you know, that's stupid. Put the hat on them bastards. Put it on them. Hey, look, if they line up and they're running this double pinch stunt, you make this call. They ain't running it. Don't make the call. Well, how do we know? You make the call or don't make the call. It works. Just act like, you know. Be right. And they, they're a lot, see, they don't want that responsibility. So you just push it down their throat, and they'll react much better than if you try to guess right. Because you can't guess right. Not from where we sit. But out there, they know a lot more what's going on than you think they do. So I've just found that the more times I do that, the better off I am. Hey, you make the call. You see the sucker? You make the call. And we, it's amazing how much better that's been than when I tried to force it. Anytime in the side of 15, use this blocking scheme. Jesus Christ. I, I can't, I, 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 did, I did a lousy job that way. I did. I know I did. Okay, anybody else? Well, let me just wrap it up. I've enjoyed it. It's been, it's been a good session. Um, you know, this, 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 is, this is where all this happened. Well, as I said, it's only been the last six years I've had that control. Uh, only the last six years. But I'm going to tell you, it is the answer. If you can convince the head coach that you will make the running game work, if he gives you the liberty to coach them all for that phase, and you have to obviously have the support of your coaches because they're going to get their toes stepped on. Our head coach does it for me. He tells them, this is the way it's going to be. You don't like it, come see me. He is calling the shots. And I step on a lot of, a lot of toes. But it, it, what it does, it gets us all on the same page. Because the coach was my best friend, you know. And he, 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 he was convinced we were going to be pretty good if we, if we got tied together. We had some young coaches at the time. And... Uh, it, it's, it's worked better than I ever thought it would. I was really nervous about how they would react to me coaching their players. And I try not to, if, if, if they get to them before I get to them and I hear the right things, I try to shut up. And I try to encourage them if I didn't see it right. Um, and I apologize when I don't see it right. 
And I don't allow anybody else to do that other than the position coach. I, I don't think that works too good because everybody thinks they're going to suddenly be the answer, but boy, it does clean it up. To be able to go get those receivers, now you talk about it. Now you talk about it. Great. Yeah. And they, they, they do a magnificent job because they're accountable. And guys, that's what the whole problem is in the game. It's, it's, it's a big problem in Pro Bowl. It's a big problem for you guys. We got all these egos that don't want to be accountable. And somebody's got to be the asshole and the jerk and make everybody accountable. And I was a prime candidate, and you could be too. You just have to make players see that it's okay to be wrong if you've got a reason to be wrong. But be, be aggressively wrong. Do something and, and have a standard and force that standard. Don't let them think it's okay. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a death trap. For our, for our profession, and we're one of the last strongholds, as you know, and you just gotta, you gotta demand that they, that they do what's right. And that's why I'm convinced uh, that, that we went through the running back thing without change with some just good players because we forced them to do it the right way. And, and I, the, the first guy was Luck. He was a great player. But the other guys that came through that system, they go out there and knock off 140, 130, 160. Guys, that's the system. That is the system. But it's the system with the quarterback faking, the wide receiver blocking, the fullback being in the right place, everybody being tied together. It, it isn't just making the running back be a runner. It's, it's tying all that together and then not allowing um, the bad place. Now, if you think you're going to go back and put wide zone strong and wide zone weak into what you're already doing, you ain't going to do that, guys. I mean, you got to remember how many times I run that thing, okay? So, I mean, you, you're not going to get 13 reps this spring and learn to run, learn to run wide zone. <laughs> you're going to be like that. You're going to end up dipping like everybody else in pro ball does because that's easy. You know, down block, down block, down, dip it around there. That I don't. That is not wide zone to me at all. What I'm looking for is a play that I know I can go run, you know, nine times a week and four times strong and tight zone five times a week and six times strong and attack the zone dogs the way I want to attack them and go play action and run the ball 35 times, throw 35 passes and and uh, and score points. And I think there is the marriage that you have to have. And uh, I don't think there's any shortcuts to it. Okay. I understand. I was right there. I know exactly. Yeah, the head coach. The head coach did that. The head coach did that. Uh, yeah, I think he wanted to do it. I think. I think it would be your 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 being able to communicate with the head coach enough that he had confidence that you could get that done. Um, and I don't make this a run pass deal, just so we all clear there. I don't I don't I don't believe in that. Uh, I really don't want to run it more than half the time. I don't, because we we gonna lose if we do that. And and if if, if we run it too much, we are gonna lose too. I don't I don't I don't buy that. And I don't pick in my players because they run block better than they pass block. I don't believe in that shit either. I don't. That don't work. And whatever we start the game with, I can care less. I mean, I don't even look at sometimes those plays. I don't. I don't. That's not important to me. But. Uh, that being all on the same page and having a philosophy of what our scheme is, I think gives us a tremendous edge. And, uh, and I think it would anybody. I don't think it's us, because I don't think we coach that much better than anybody else does. I, 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 just, I just know we are, we're getting all of them pulling together in a running game, and it is a lot easier than I can remember it being at times. So the runner listens, because I mean they know they, they they can't wait to come to our place. Now I mean, they they want to get drafted at our place, because 
You know, they're going to get the ball, and we're going we're gonna to run it, and we're going to run it in a way that he knows he's got a chance to be really good. Uh, well, I, I can't answer it, but that's, that's kind of the way I do it. Okay. Uh, I'm not much on young players, and I don't think many of you are either. You know, I don't see how young guys play very good. I, I, I wish I had to answer that one. Uh, it's too hard. It, it's too big a jump. It's too, too drastic. Uh, I coach the scout team uh, every day. I do the scout team. And uh, I coach my players on the scout team. That's all I do. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I hold the cards up in the blocking schemes and get the handoffs and the cadences and do all that. But I coach five guys that are red shirt players. That's all I do. And I coach the living shit out of them. Knowing that somewhere, sometime, they're going to be my guys. And uh, I think that has helped me in pro ball a great deal. In college, sometimes you got them going at the same time, don't you? Don't, so you can't, can't do it quite like We don't have very many players. Uh, our, our sport's a little different. I get seven on game day. Seven helmets. Okay, I, I can run all the wide zones weak and strong by tossing the ball as well. Okay, I like to run a lead draw, strong and weak, mostly strong, because I like that's my favorite second long play, two back strong. Um, I want the fullback force weak and strong. You see what I've done here? I'm, and I, yeah, yeah. See, what I've done is I haven't made mine so that they aren't I'm doing the same shit, see. I, I got a little advantage here. Uh, but I'm not a counter guy. I used to be. I've been in systems that were. But it's big little. I, I, how do you run weak counter and be consistent? I, I can't. I, it's impossible. That's what I call two-back strong, lead draw. Lead ISO. Because it's our number one play action. So... I run it on second and long. It's the play I always want thumbed up on, on the second and long. If we're going to run the ball, that's what I want to bring at him. So I, you know, nine or ten at the most. And uh, he'll force a couple on me every couple of weeks, you know, a counter jab and a jab. And a... They don't work, guys. They don't, they, you can't get good at all those things. I can't. I can't tried for years and years. Um, our first three years in Denver it was one of our top five plays. And then I saw less consistency and less consistency and less, and I gave it up. Just gave it up. Hadn't run uh, one this year. Did not run one. And I'm getting more rather than less. I'm getting more tightened down. But I will tell you this. Every one of those wide zone weeks will have five formations. Every one of those wide zone strongs is going to have six or eight formations. So in order to get it practiced for the people formation-wise, it's not as repetitious for them, but it is for me. So I come out of it in pretty good shape. And then we'll probably carry three nickel runs, um, two goal line plays. My short yardage always comes out of, out of what we do in base. I don't believe in short yardage per se because I like to throw the ball half the time and goal line and short yardage. And uh, so we don't have a lot of those. What we have is a lot of formations and, and, and systems like that. It's the same step, crossover, roll down, read number one to two, first guy pass the ball. We teach it as a cutback. Our blocking schemes are all dictated that way. Any tight zone is a rollback play. So we teach the backside is the point of attack, the front side is a read. So everything technique-wise on the backside, there are no more cutting. It's all push by. It's all slide by. So the same belly play you learned 100 years ago is the same steps. Our tailback, indoor, fullback, we had a fullback run it. We don't, but if you did, it's the same. Read the first down lineman, pass the ball to rollback. If they pinch, you jump. Other than that, backside, backside. So we teach a backside to tight plays and a backside.
to wide place. And that's where we spend the crux of our time teaching. The, we, we tell them that they never put the second step down if you're uncovered. So you get one step, and if it hadn't happened, you start climbing. So we don't, we don't have near as wide a landmark because we don't want to cross over foot. We want to take a lead step, left guard or right guard, or right tackle, left tackle, if he was working with a tight end, or the center if he's working uncovered. We, we only take one step, and if he hadn't come to us, we go up. We start climbing. Because the ball is rolling back. We're trying to wall people the other way. Totally. Oh, it's a tighter landmark. And we tell him, even on an inside pinch, don't hurry off. Don't ever leave fast. Because too many good players can step in and come back out. And on tight zone, they'll make that play. You know, so I don't let a tackle or a guard come off on tight zone on an inside slight move. I just stay double and make the linebacker make the play. Again, consistency. The only reason I really am convinced you have to have tight zone is when they give us width, like let's just say that somebody to stop our wide zone lined up like this. I mean, like that, then I want to run and roll back there. I want to run and roll back to bubbles to have width. If this is here, I don't, you know, I'd rather run wide zone. But if it gets out there, or even when you go to two tight ends and they get, if they line up like that to two tight ends, I mean, I don't care where, I want to roll back into those holes. And that's really the crux of tight zone plays. Uh, there's some big plays there, but it's usually because the runner's a good player, I think. But good consistency. One of the things we do, I think, really smart, and it, this took me a long time to convince people to do, but we virtually are 90% run on second and short. We want to have an ugly, nasty, dirty first down. I mean, so we run a very conservative tight zone, weak or strong, on 90% of the second and shorts. And I know everybody out here, everybody say, well, that's the down to go. Fuck that, go for it, shit. Let's get that son of a bitch in first down, and then you go for it. So let's take, and I like those things where there's piles of bodies at the end of those plays. You know, those, you know, gristles and people gr screaming down in there and all that shit. You made three on second and one. Now that is, that is really good football. You know, now go throw the ball, coach. We're ready now, baby. Let's go. <laughs> it's a lot easier to stick that thing right down in there and gristle them out. Uh, I really believe in that kind of concept. And uh, I think it's it loosens up the whole prospect game. But we get smart and try to do some stupid things there too. And then don't make a first down, I want to die. Like, damn. All right, guys, I gotta get to bed here. First of all, you can't ask him to, to guard with his snap hand. So don't even try that. Don't even fucking try that. Uh, he must snap the ball with a snap hand. He's got to use his off hand. Now, we are a big drag team. I won't say that the right way. It sounds like a bunch of fags. But... By not mollying, when that guard does that, his inside hand's on that shade nose button. I don't give a fuck where that nose is going. He's going to get a hand from this and in the backhand of the center. And the center's backhand has to be his offhand, his left hand. His kick changes from right to left, right? Because your body weight has to distribute itself up under. So we always go to guide hand, but we drag call virtually every shade nose to the side of duel. The other side, we drag with the center off so that the guard can stay behind. So I don't think that's as big an element and I teach that in one-on-one. I teach all of these concepts in one-on-one, and this is the hardest thing I have to do. Because when they get to one-on-one, they want to fight. But if they play for me, they want to fight. 
So I, 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 if, if I'm working combinations, that's fine. But if I'm doing one on one day, I want them lined up just like this. And I start over here, and that guy's going to drag hand, and that guy's going to snap every outside wiggle. And if that guy's shaded, that guard on his side is going to drag hand. Do you understand? So everything he does in one-on-one -on -one is going to be the way it really is. Really is. Not one-on-one. -on -one. I'm sorry? Well, I'm going to pull the ball here so my off hand has to be. So my kick foot is on the guy on that side. Same way here. My kick foot has to be there. Still, my lead hand is here. But i got to stay behind the drag of the, of the side of the guard. Now, if you molly the guard, you can't do that, guys. If you, if you tell this guard he's got to pop out of here and read that one or that one, fuck, you can't drag off that. Now, you go back and bang. But shit, that's, he's up the field two yards now. So we drag that thing off all the time. Always left hand. If I'm a right hand snap. No, he isn't because I'm going to drag. Well, when, when they get to one on one, that guy's going to line up there or there. Okay? So the guard that was beside him is going to molly out and drag off. <laughs> uh, defense line person don't like that. Fuck him. I got my problems too. I ain't going to let that happen. Shit, I ain't going to do that. I ain't going to stand there. What are you going to do? Widen them out there five yards? I don't do that. No, I mean, and, and, and I, I, I try not to, I don't, want, I, don't want, I don't want my guard doing that. Shit, that ain't fair. But, but I, never, I never pass block a center that my guards aren't live and they go this way and they drag off in case that nose runs one of those big loopers. He ain't going to learn to pass pro if he's got space. The only guy that really ends up one-on-one -on -one for us is our tackles. And uh, that's their world. And they got to learn to live there with slide or what. Okay. All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much.